welcome back students to one more session of your uh, physical chemistry chapter we have again come back to part one book basically i've been doing aldehydes ketones and carboxylic acids that's a very major chapter in organic chemistry and the maximum weightage for your board exams that is your five marks now after that i've come to a lighter chapter once we do a lighter chapter because you know when we do a lighter chapter which is of less weightage right it is easily it is easy for you to score those three marks correct or if it is for uh, uh, two marks if it is for uh, three marks it's easy for me you know i can quickly complete one chapter and i'll have that satisfaction that okay i'm done with this chapter for the board exam so i've started with this chapter that is general principles and uh, processes for isolation of elements that basically it is called metallurgy chapter. so your metallurgy chapter uh, the weightage for this for your board exam is 3 marks so you have it for 3 marks right you may get in this 3 marks can be directly given as 1 2 3 one one mark each or it can be divided into one mark question that is your very short answer that is direct question and it can be two marks that is short answer type 1 so short answer type 1 so this also may be demarcated or it can be given together so whenever we see isolation or uh, general principles and process of isolation of elements this chapter let us first in uh, discuss the the sub topics of the chapter that means let me introduce the chapter to you all so most important thing in this chapter is you should know the extraction of metals and some there are certain uh, general uh, reactions and certain general questions also i'll be doing that yes let us see the index first so in this particular metallurgy chapter we are going to learn first important question or what is the difference between a mineral and an ore this is a very famous question i don't know why it is so famous so you should know what is the difference between mineral and ore after that your <coughs> process of isolation i said so this metallurgy chapter i am going to first learn once i learn the definition of mineral and the ore i am going to study the different types of ores okay once i learn the different different types of ores for example for iron copper silver gold yeah zinc aluminum all these different types of ores i'll study once i study the different types of ores i'm going to go into a concept called concentration of the ores okay in concentration of the ores first basically what what do you do first you take the ore which is there and you try to separate it isn't it so under that separate it from the impurities so under this concentration terms we are going to learn about froth flotation method we are also going to learn about magnetic separation method we are also going to learn about if i uh, specifically speak about aluminum we are going to learn about a topic called leaching this is basically used for now if i see froth flotation is used for separating iron pyrites copper pyrites i can use it for zinc i can use it for uh, pbs also lead also so magnetic separation is basically used for separating the iron iron ores that is your hematite magnetite and all those leaching is basically used for your separation of aluminum from bauxite ore okay let us come back after doing this concentration methods then i am going to gradually go into the extraction of this so So when I go to the extraction methods, right? So <clears throat> in this extraction method, there are steps. What is that step? Basically, first you are going to do the calcination. Okay, let us write under extraction. You can write. You are going to study about calcination. You are going to study about roasting. And from here, once the ore is roasted, <coughs> we are going to take it to different types of extraction techniques. So if for your grade twelve, you have extraction of iron. you have extraction of aluminum you have extraction of zinc you have extraction of copper <coughs> you have extraction of silver extraction of gold you are also going to study extraction of nickel means extraction there i'll teach you about refining of nickel right nickel and zirconium these are also there this is a vanerical process very simple to learn right so once we have extracted we are going to take this whole process into we we get the liquid metal isn't it from there the liquid method is metal is going we'll take it to a refinery so this technique is called refining technique 
So in this defining technique, you also have many different processes. I'm writing it here for refining. Just observe. Refining, you can learn or we, or we have, they'll be asking you directly. So different types of refining techniques which you have is your distillation process. Very easy actually, the chapter is very easy, but you should know how to write it in words. After distillation, we are going to study what is the method of electrolysis. We'll also study what is the method of chromatography. We are be teaching about column chromatography. We'll be also learning what is the method of zone refining. <coughs> zone refining. After zone refining, we'll be also learning about your uh, liquefaction process. Yes, very important. Liquefaction process. <coughs> then we'll be learning about vapor phase refining. Where I'll be preparing uh, vapor phase refining, nickel and zirconium vapor phase refining. So all these processes, one after the other will follow. After all these refining techniques, I'll be going into a topic called or topic labeled as elegam diagram. I'll also teach the elegam diagram because that will be very important. A very question, important question is also asked from elegam diagram. So let us learn what is elegam diagram. N is silent here, elegam diagram. After elegam diagram, you have to concentrate on two more topics. What are those two more topics? <coughs> Electrochemical aspects of metallurgy and thermochemical aspects of metallurgy. Both are there. So what should you learn? Electrochemical aspects of metallurgy and thermodynamic aspects i can write it as thermodynamic aspects of metallurgy thermodynamic aspects of metallurgy these two are very important questions once i am done with uh, the seventh concept that is your electrochemical thermodynamic uh, this one i'll directly jump into some certain number of general questions I'll also cover certain general questions which are <coughs> question and answers which will be asked more frequently and I'll end up the chapter with board questions. This is my chapter and <coughs> this is how I'm going to complete the whole chapter. Every question is be, will be dealt, right? So let us meet again first, yeah. But important thing is whenever I do this chapter, I'll do it in a single pane. Like for example, if I take iron, right? I'm going to show you iron isolation or iron ore then it's your concentration method, then your extraction method and your refining method. Like that we'll be learning for everything so that all the topics are covered. Right. So after the introduction, let us start with the basic definitions of the chapter. So what are these? These are the common definitions which are asked. Let us see and then go back directly to the topic where uh, you can easily score those three marks in the chapter. Right. So first, basically, we are asked to do, suppose if you are if we are asked to define mineral and an ore. Okay. Or the difference between a mineral and ore. So let, let us write. So what is a mineral? <coughs> we very well know an earth crust is a combination of n, uh, n number of uh, minerals, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, along with that we also have impurities right again we have ores in present in those uh, or a type of uh, mineral which we call it as ore so let us start from this minerals are if i have to write the definition are naturally occurring substances in which metals and their compounds exist. Okay. This is what I can easily, this is the uh, way of writing a definition. So minerals are naturally occurring substances, right, in which metals and their compounds, the corresponding compounds exist together in nature, right. Now what is an ore? I have to start the answer like this. Ores are minerals. Please uh, let me tell you why am I writing like that. So, ores are minerals. Yes, right. From which metals can be extracted economically. 
right what does it mean economically that means i can the metal which i suppose if i require iron metal i have to go to its <coughs> ore right or ore of iron is hematite or magnetite or siderite right so i'll go pick up that ore i'll do the different uh, steps like concentration your uh, first i have to separate it right after that i have to concentrate it after that i have to do the extraction after that i have to do the refining then i get the pure metal so what can i do I, instead of the mineral i can pick up the ore and from there i can extract the metal that too economically economically means in a cheap way so in a cheap way done so now what question board board asks is all are all minerals ores or all ores are minerals so this is where i asked to do the definition so remember all ores are minerals remember this that is what i wrote ores are minerals but all minerals are not ores this is what you have to remember right i can extract or ores are minerals a class of compounds from which i can extract metals but all minerals are not ores i can't generalize it as they contain the ore particular ore from which i can extract the metal no so remember this line this is what they going to ask you if they ask you you can justify this answer writing these definitions and you can write in your own words also done now what is gange gange are impurities which are present along with the ores impurities present along with ores okay done now what is slag we call one word word called slag then we call flux also okay let us see what is slag of flux slag actually slag is a combined product that means it is a fusible product fusible product means combined product combined product <coughs> fusible product when is it formed when yes when you i told you gange isn't it gange is present in this ore so your gange combines with a, 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 a compound called flux gange plus flux they form slag okay so slag is that liquid layer which i can separate it out in the form of impurities i can wash it off or separate it because it forms a layer above the metal surface so gange <coughs> the impurity plus your flux together forms slag as in when i do the examples i'll show you examples with silica and iron oxide also and gradually i'll show you different different examples so as of now remember minerals are not ores but ores are minerals gange is impurity slag is the combination of this so i'll meet you directly into the topic now i'll be starting with extraction of iron yes so students we have already started with the chapter we have already also learned the definitions which are important for us in metallurgy chapter so we have already learned what is meant by a mineral <coughs> that which exists in the earth's crust then we also learned what is meant by an ore right then i also taught you the basic definitions but that is one is your uh, gange and one is your slag right now directly i am go going into the topic depth of the topic what am i doing for every metal right basically for aluminium or iron copper silver gold i'll be doing the complete i'll be giving the complete picture in every video so this whole thing completes your iron extraction when you are studying for your exam one particular video all the data will be there and after that after iron suppose if i'm giving you aluminium i'll give you the whole of aluminium then again we'll go to copper like that so let us start with iron so basically when i speak about iron metal right so iron as i said whenever we are extracting we are trying to extract a metal we are going to or we are going to pick up the ores of that particular metal why because that is the easiest and economical way for extracting the uh, metal that is what we have studied so first i'm going to take or pick up the ores of aluminium sorry ores of iron so what are the different ores if i say the basic ore hematite yeah the first one hematite so in this hematite your formula is fe2o3 then we have the next ore of iron that is <coughs> your magnetite magnetite the formula is the higher oxidation state fe3o4 right now after that you have one more ore called siderite 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 okay siderite that is your iron carbonate feco3 you have one more ore which you are going to study 
right uh, iron pyrites iron pyrites right so simple fes2 now what are we going to do now from the earth's crust we are going to pick up this uh, ore of iron this iron ore is then is it undergoes different steps in the metallurgical processes the first step is we are going to separate the ore from its ganged particles so the first technique is you're going to take the ore yes step one after that step two you're going to take that ore and i uh, introduce that in a on on and what do you say magnetic separator right so magnetic separator basically uh, there's a diagram also in your ncrt no need of drawing any diagrams so on the magnetic separator you're going to pick up suppose, suppose for example if i take hematite or magnetite i'm going to take that on the magnetic separator and you have two rollers with an iron belt attached so what happens whenever you're dropping this magnetic uh, ore either hematite or magnetite that rolls or that moves on the rolls right on the rollers that moves on that particular belt and with whichever impurity or the ganj particle right as i said ganj is an impurity now we are going to consider the magnetite or the hematite as the uh, iron particle that is your the magnetic material and the ganj we are considering as non magnetic material so with this com uh, concept what do we do as and when the ore along with the ganj moves on the iron belt they get separated into two tanks one is magnetic material tank and the non magnetic material tank then so on what concept did they separate we separated them based on the magnetic properties that that is the simplest one which you can read so from that magnetic material now i've got a a uh, uh, tank with this particular ore where at least a part of ganj is separated only a part we are going to take that particular uh, tank and then we are going to take it for concentration right after separation concentration now in concentration what are we going to do we are going to do different steps at the calcination roasting right <coughs> smelting all these so basically calcination is something which you do in the absence of air roasting is in the presence of oxygen okay we'll be doing different reactions also when i do zinc and all these right so now what happened i'm going to take that ore take it for concentration so in concentration method what is the first thing your iron oxide whatever is there now let us erase this whole thing now your iron oxide i said <coughs> from the magnetic separator belt or uh, this is magnetic separation it has come for concentration in concentration i am going to do a process called calcination we call it as calcination here why i am going to take fe2o3 dot xh2o right some moles of water when you are heating it you are just heating it not i am not saying in the presence of this one when you are heating it immediately this bond dissociates and you get fe2o3 and plus xh2o so this is done the water water moisture is there that gets evaporated now we are left with this iron oxide now this is your main process now from the concentration process we are taking it and introducing into or we are taking it into a step called extraction of the metal now this is in the oxide form now i have to extract the metal then only i can send it for refining so first is isolation of the ore or separation of the ore from there i have gone to concentration methods so in separation of the ore i i took it to the magnetic belt from there i went to concentration method in the concentration method i introduced calcination in the calcination some of the vapors some of the water which is present evaporated i am left with iron oxide now that iron oxide is taken or it is sent for extraction process so now we are going to study after that extraction of iron so for that extraction of iron <coughs> extraction of iron so directly the question is given write the extraction method of iron you are supposed to write the heading the table and that diagram okay diagram also not required but you should remember the temperatures now basically the extraction of iron is done in a long cylindrical blast furnace yes let us see the parts of the blast furnace first so basically a blast furnace is an arrangement of cup and cone at the top right yes this blast furnace what happens what is the uh, use of this on the surface of this particular part we are going to introduce three important things first your ore which is this ore your fe2o3 which i said which we are going to purify this is your ore apart from that i am going to introduce calcium carbonate that is your limestone what is the role of this limestone basically the limestone is used to remove silica or the sand which is there in, along with your iron ore to form slag so calcium carbonate what is the role if they ask you it is used to remove silica where i'll show the reactions in the form of slag 
right now let us come use this now coke i'm also going to introduce coke or carbon what is the use of carbon basically this carbon acts as a reducing agent the reaction with which your carbon is reducing and forming carbon monoxide that thing gives you the whole whatever energy or whatever heat is required in the whole blast furnace that coke will provide us so the role of coke is to supply the amount of heat required for all these reactions almost it will go above 2000 also yes now once the this particular or this whole thing is fed let us come back slowly once this is fed there is uh, there are two uh, one is your uh, outlet for the exhaust gases which is present above and the center uh, at the base you have again one more inlet this is your outlet and this is your inlet in the inlet you have a blast of air and oxygen which is sent inside okay now this is called if I call this part as shaft now I gradually when I come down the lower part of the shaft is again divided into one two three and four zones very important after these zones when we come down right there are there are important thing you have to remember the lower part of the shaft is called tyrus what do we call we call it as t u y <coughs> tyrus or tyrus so <laughs> this particular thing uh, this is where your uh, the blast of air or oxygen which is required enters into the earth right of the furnace now what happens once we at the, at the lower part of this furnace you have something a column called hearth right so now at this hearth at the lower bottom on one side you have all the solid waste which is collected and you have your pig iron which is collected on the other side okay now that is the basic idea which you, which you should remember now what actually is important when I take this ore when I introduce with calcium carbonate and coke there are different layers and different zones which are formed in the blast furnace the first zone first uh, thing is um, I've divided into four different zones the first zone is called zone of reduction so what did I do for that particular thing I made a table right let us write first temperature range what is the temperature range it is 400 to 700 degree centigrade now what is a zone called zone of reduction please write it like this only it is easy for the examiner also to count yes now second zone second zone range is from 800 degrees to 1000 degrees this is called zone of slag formation now this one 1100 to your 1300 degrees centigrade this is called zone of fusion zone of fusion after that above this 1300 that is it goes up beyond 2000 also uh, that is uh, i will write greater than 1300 right now where is this occurring above 1300 it is occurring near the hearth isn't it near the hearth so, so what is that hearth the lower part of the blast furnace hearth this part this part is called the hearth done <coughs> now let us see the first reaction first important thing is we are feeding the ore with calcium we are mixing up with calcium carbonate and coke and introducing into this furnace now what happens the hot air or the blast of air and oxygen is supplied from both the sides into the furnace so during this process let us see the reaction the first important thing in the zone of reduction reaction as the name suggests reduction right your iron ore your Fe2O3 first important thing is reduced <coughs> with coke that is what I said correct so this is going to what happens your iron oxide your iron gets reduced to iron and your carbon gets oxidized to carbon dioxide right that is balance later next important your iron oxide is also reduced with one more reducing agent that is carbon monoxide so the same story iron gets reduced to iron carbon dioxide carbon monoxide gets oxidized to carbon dioxide so let us balance if i see okay let me put this is two okay this is three then this is four this also is three okay then if i balance this reaction i can write this as three 
okay yes mm, then if i take this as 3 okay this is 2 because fe2 yes now 3 if i take okay this is carbon dioxide so let us count here 2 to the 4 four iron here 3 carbons three carbons here 3 to the 6 oxygen six oxygens balanced in this reaction two iron two iron oxygens are 3 plus 3 6 here 3 to the 6 carbon is 3 here 3 Done. So in your first process zone of reduction, this is going to happen. So let us write the physical states here. Iron oxide is solid state, right? This is very important. <coughs> Now coke also is solid state, solid. <coughs> yes. Then iron becomes liquid state. This becomes gaseous state or vapor state. Here iron is in liquid state. This becomes your gaseous state. Done. so important thing what should you write what is the change occur occurring here iron gets reduced to spongy iron and coke gets oxidized this is what you have to write gets oxidized right simple that's the first zone after that when the particular uh, feed enters into this zone what is the zone zone of slag formation very important now observe carefully slag i said so what is slag <coughs> your ganche plus flux gives a slag so now what happens this carbon dioxide from here which is here enters or this enters into the zone yes now this carbon dioxide again combines with your coke so it's going to form carbon monoxide to very important this carbon monoxide is acting as a reducing agent let us see whether it is balanced two carbon two carbon oxygen two this is the most important reaction of the whole furnace why because this particular reaction is a highly exothermic reaction because of this exothermic reaction the heat or which is generated transfers gets transferred to all the zones and allows the other reactions to happen so remember the important reaction of this zone because there is a formation of reducing agent this reducing agent goes and reduces the metal and finally we get a molten metal that now after that now let us see this role this calcium carbonate which acts as i said it's going to act <coughs> or it's going to remove the uh, uh, what do you say uh, the flux from that particular thing and come out as slag right so this calcium carbonate breaks up into calcium oxide plus carbon dioxide now this calcium oxide what does it do it's going to combine with silica what is the silica your sand or your impurity such as present in the so this <coughs> calcium oxide if i say this is i suppose if i say this is called as ganche ganche is combining with flux and it's going to form a compound called casio3 this is slag calcium silicate is a slag right <coughs> so very important thing you have to remember here calcium carbonate is a highly endothermic reaction right it absorbs as we have seen it will the test tube becomes cold so the amount of calcium carbonate should not be so much in the ferments right if the amount of calcium carbonate is more it tends to reduce the temperatures remember that so we basically all these are exothermic reactions this will tend to decrease the temperature so we add it in limited quantity so now this has come out as slag that is going to float when we go down right now <clears throat> what happened here what should we uh, right uh re removal of removal of slag and what else happened here form and formation of reducing agent which generates the heat that's done from here now i'm coming back to this zone zone of fusion right here all the things are going to fuse now let us see now we have our slag which is separated that's over now three four important reactions you have to write what is the first important reaction <coughs> your carbon which is there here a uh, coke is already there from our visited now this oxygen is entering into the zone this carbon combines with oxygen forming carbon dioxide gas right now this carbon dioxide gas what happen it will go and it has to escape out yes now before escaping out this carbon dioxide gas is going to combine with this coke co2 plus coke 
what do I get? I'm going to get this. Now there are two important gases. Just see, one is carbon dioxide, one is carbon monoxide. Now this carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide from here, they escape out of the furnace. Done. Now during this process, your iron, whatever is there. Now your, uh, uh, this is there, iron is there, isn't it? But still it is not complete. It's not completely uh, reduced. So <clears throat> your Fe, the leftover iron oxide, how much ever is left out, it's going to further, it's going to be further reduced by coke and this iron oxide is further reduced by carbon monoxide. So what happens here, I'm going to get now liquid iron molten iron and carbon monoxide comes out, comes out as carbon comes out as carbon monoxide here what do we have again the liquid iron which we get and the leftover carbon dioxide gas now all our vapors we are left with molten liquid slag is also ready and your carbon and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide they escape out from this particular now you have almost we have come to this part just see 1100 to 1300 degrees now everything has fused correct now the leftover iron a molten liquid or molten iron just comes down at this particular point now this molten liquid or molten this is called molten slag which one now this is your molten slag just see this is your molten slag which I have drawn here and this is your molten liquid or molten metal which molten iron which I have drawn here right now here we have two outlets one is out for the solid waste and one for the pig iron the iron which we obtain here it is further sent to the refinery where we refine uh, 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 to that particular extent where we remove all the impurities and that iron which is extracted out from the furnace is called pig iron i'll be teaching you what is pig iron and cast iron also so now pig iron is extracted out and solid waste that is your slag is extracted out from the side now, my most important thing you have to remember, the slag is lighter than your metal. So, it tries to float above the iron metal and you are separated. Now, what will happen near the hearth? Yes, separation of, okay, we have not written this, we will write separation of solid wastes and pig iron done so now here what happened you have to write this also is in a fusion so what happened it is further reduction of feo to fe liquid and release of gases so carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide they got extracted out. so this is your whole uh, extraction start from the ore send it to the magnetic separator the magnetic belt then get it to the concentration process where you sub may prepare or you're going to convert fe2o3 or allow the vapor to escape that iron oxide you're going to get it to the blast furnace and show it in the different zones and finally show the formation of pig iron this completes your three marks if extraction of iron or metallurgy of iron is given to you So we have already seen the extraction of iron, the complete process, please go through all the uh, link topics in iron. So now uh, this is the quite common question which is asked, so let us see. What do we see in your blast furnace after following the different zones in the blast furnace, we have finally got two things. One is your molten slag that floats or above the uh, molten metal. Now that metal which we collected is called pig iron. Now they have asked us what is the difference between pig iron and cast iron. Right, let us write the difference. Now your pig iron, your cast iron. It doesn't. So when I speak about pig iron from where do we get, we have got pig iron from uh, after a series of reactions in the blast furnace. So let us write that. Obtained after a series of reactions in blast furnace okay right <clears throat> cast iron how do i obtain i can obtain cast iron when i pick up this pig iron just observe pig iron plus your scrap iron plus your coke what is the role of coke here coke is acting as a reducing agent when i heat all these three in the blast of air means i am going to introduce a roasted blast of air when i try to roast all these i am going to get cast iron that is your component 
so this these are the three important components of cast iron now second important thing why am i not writing iron okay iron the next important thing pig iron contains 4% carbon so because of this 4% carbon i can easily <clears throat> mold it into toys or you know whichever shape it's not so hard as cast iron cast iron is very hard so whichever you if you want to make uh, agriculture implements or hard very hard things like your hammers and all these we try to use cast iron because if it's it's very hard as it is brittle also right because of the percentage now 4% carbon in pig iron and 3% carbon in cast iron i'm just telling the differences now when i speak about the impurities pig iron along with this uh, 4% carbon it also has impurities as we have seen in the blast furnace silica isn't it it has silica as an impurity it has phosphorus as an impurity it has uh, sulfur as an impurity yes it has manganese also as impurity yes certain traces of uh, manganese also are present right so uh, when i speak about cast iron as i said 3% carbon perfect it's used as i've mentioned already uh, for the uses of uh, your cast iron and pig uh, wrought iron yes so you can just see like this is if i say 3% carbon hence it is hard and brittle these are the uses which i have listed out please note it and uh, let us meet again with your extraction of aluminium so this is done with your iron this is more than enough for your nc uh, cbsc preparation for your board exam Right. So, welcome back students to one more session of your metallurgy chapter. So, we've already seen the extraction of iron. Hope you would have understood the concept. So, again, now I'll, I'll be directly going into the extraction of aluminium. This is how I'm going to do. Then I'll be doing zinc, then copper, then silver, nickel, zirconium. Yes. So, whenever we are speaking about uh, an extraction of particular metal, as I said, we are going to pick or we are going to extract this metal economically from an ore. So, whenever you're studying metallurgy of aluminium, the most important thing which you have to remember is first try to mention the ores of aluminium so what are the ores of aluminium aluminium if i speak about the ores it exists in two different forms one is your bauxite and one is your gypsite so let us write the formula bauxite ore of aluminium formula is al2o3 dot uh, 2h2o that is your uh, the bauxite and when I come back and speak about gypsite it is Al2O3 dot 3H2 this is your gypsite now what are we going to do we are going to pick up this particular uh, oats and from that we are going to first separate or purify the metal after purification then we'll take it for further uh, uh, reduction and uh, refining and everything right so, if this question is given to you, how is alumina separated from or purified from silica in bauxite ore? Give equation. Now, basically, whenever we speak about bauxite, bauxite has two types of impurities. What are the two types of impurities? It has Al2O3 dot 2H2O has SiO2 silica as an impurity and TiO2 titanium dioxide as an impurity. So, we uh, our task is to remove these impurities and then send it for reduction. So, for separation or purification of this uh, silica we are going to utilize or we are going to use two types of methods one method is called surpex process surpex method and the second method is called a process of leaching these two are <coughs> purification methods only in the exam they directly ask you what is the process of leaching so you can write this answer let us come back and see so in surplus method first most important thing what are we doing we are going to pick up this uh, metal metal oxide right so first i'm going to take this metal oxide done i'm going to combine with two important reagents what are the two important reagents okay that 2 h2o is inbuilt in the inbuilt in the, in the, in the molecule water of crystallization right so this aluminium trioxide i'm going to combine with nitrogen and then i'm going to combine with the reducing agent coke correct so this acts as a reducing agent. when all these are going to combine at 200 2073 kelvin so when this combines what is the use of nitrogen just see first important product aluminium nitride comes out because i'm going to further process this and the leftover comes out as carbon monoxide 
that so this is your first step in the second step we are going to further help because i have to convert it into aluminium oxide the purest form isn't it right so this aluminium nitride i'm going to further allow it to undergo hydrolysis when i allow it to undergo hydrolysis this first important this forms aluminium hydroxide this forms aluminium hydroxide i have not at balanced the reaction aluminium hydroxide and the leftover comes out as ammonia vapor so this is why we have taken nitrogen here so that comes out as a gaseous by product and i can easily remove it now still we are not done aluminium hydroxide and what am i going to do i am going to heat this aluminium hydroxide further at now this is 2000 73 now it is 1473 kelvin when i heat it as 1473 kelvin this dissociates into two important compounds what it get converted into aluminium trioxide that is the basic form of that plus your water of crystallization comes out yes done so this is also over now this aluminium trioxide now is sent for reduction method this is further sent for reduction i'll be teaching reduction process also yes now let us come back to leaching basically leaching is a process where when when do we use leaching or what concept do we use uh, leaching leaching is basically used on this concept just see you have to remember or is soluble in the particular base which we add and your gange particles or the impurities should be insoluble if this is the concept i can easily dissolve the ore and separate out the gange with this concept let us start so for a leaching process the most important thing which you require is leaching agent so what is the leaching agent which we are going to use leaching agent used here is mineral acids i can use mineral acids then i can use aqueous solution of that particular ore that particular aqueous solution i will be doing it now aqueous solution of ore so first what am i going to do i am going to pick up your uh, aluminium oxide right your bauxite ore i am going to pick, take this bauxite ore al2o3 yes i am going to fuse it with sodium hydroxide and as i said aqua solution water yes now this whole thing combines together and forms a coordinate covalent complex how are you going to write first try to write sodium and write a square brackets now aluminium combines with this hydroxyl group so yes this is called sodium meta aluminate sodium meta aluminate right now this is leached this compound is leached with this base aqueous base and it forms a complex now still we are not done what am i going to do now na sodium meta aluminate let us name this as 1 let us name this as 2 i am going to take this sodium sodium meta aluminate and i am going to neutralize this how am i going to neutralize i am going to add carbon dioxide to this now this becomes a neutralization reaction isn't it so when i am trying to neutralize what is the use of carbon dioxide because your sodium comes out with this carbon dioxide as any hco3 sodium bicarbonate which can be taken washed off now the left over is your aluminum <coughs> hydroxide okay okay if you still want to write it separately you can write like this your na addition uh, breaks up into al2o3 yes and your h2o xh2o this is plus now still we are not done what are we going to do we are going to pick this aluminum trioxide dot xh2o and i'm further going to heat what temperature at 1470 kelvin i'm going to heat this when you heat it the bonds between these two break up and i get al2o3 plus xh2o this is your aluminum trioxide which is very very pure now 99% pure aluminum trioxide but still the metal is not extracted this aluminum trioxide i'm going to take it further for refining now most important here in this particular reaction and what should we remember you i said silica is has to be the more isn't it now that silica whatever is there sio2 combines with coke coke is your reducing agent that coke when it combines it forms or just see silica comes out and carbon monoxide or silica sand is out and your carbon monoxide comes out so this is acting as a reducing agent yes so silica 
forms it uh, uh, converts into its metallic form and carbon get, gets oxidized to carbon monoxide so this is your complete purification of bauxite ore so please remember wherever you are writing try to write the reagents if you can write the use of this reducing agent use of this nitrogen coming out as aluminium nitride again uh, what are you writing yes uh, use of this uh, coke for converting or removing silica sand from that use of this where leaching agent where you forms a complex and use of this carbon dioxide to neutralize the reaction so finally this so this is your reaction Yes, uh, so we've already seen the concentration methods that is your leaching and your surplex process. Now what do we do once it is done? We are going to take this aluminium oxide which is formed, right? Al2O3 which is formed and we, uh, we send it for further extraction. From extraction then we send it for smelting. From smelting we are going to send it for refining, right? So now what happens in extraction? Basically extraction process are of two types. What are the two types? <coughs> when I speak about red bauxite right bauxite formula is your al2o3 isn't it al2o3 dot 2h2o now there are two types red bauxite and white bauxite right so red bauxite and white bauxite if i have to extract it now red bauxite what is the difference red bauxite contains your al2o3 along with that you have iron as impurity this is your iron oxide as impurity in red bauxite and here for white bauxite again al2o3 and sio2 silica is an impurity so you have to remove these two right you have to extract this from the removing impurities now for purifying or extracting uh, it can also say purify for extracting red bauxite we are going to use a process called bayer's process for uh, white bauxite for purification of white bauxite which i'm uh, we are going to use a process called surplex process so which i have already done surplex is already done please check the earlier video yes so let us learn what is bayer's process now i said i have to separate now let us start with the bayer's process and see what what steps are involved in that now extraction or i can also write purification this is better extraction or purification of aluminium or L of aluminium right so in Bayer's process first what do we do we are going to take that particular bauxite Al2O3 which is obtained from your uh, leaching or smelting so instead of Al2O3 shall I write bauxite better so I'm going to write bauxite so this bauxite is first sent for crushing or milling once it is sent for crushing and milling, what happens? This whole thing is sent into a vessel called pressure vessel. This whole process occurs in a pressure vessel. Right. Now, to this pressure vessel, you are going to induce or fuse it with sodium hydroxide. Yes. Now, to this sodium hydroxide, when you are fusing it, what? So now what we do from the pressure vessel, we are going to further send it or when this is fused together with bauxite, you get a complex like this. What is a complex? Sodium, aluminium, hydroxide. This is your complex. Now during this process, what happens? Whatever red mud is there, your red mud, right? That gets filtered off. So red mud gets filtered. So this particular thing is done. Now we, they're going to take this complex and they're going to further and allow it to undergo a process called crystallization. Right. During crystallization, what happens? You're infusing water to this right so that complex breaks up or it divides into two uh, particles because your na is out and your aluminium hydroxide forms a separate complex so during crystallization al oh taken threads done so this aluminium hydroxide what do we do we are going to further cool this okay right you can hear also you can cool it then only cooling right when you cool it what happens it will get crystals that is what is understood so we are going to after crystallization which is infused with water this aluminium hydroxide further we are going to send it to a rotary kiln okay i'll write this here we are going to send it further to a kiln or means which rotates continuously that is called rotary kiln 
where you're heating it. When you're heating it, aluminium hydroxide, it breaks up. We very well know what is the reaction. Aluminium hydroxide, when you're heating it, it will break up into two important things. What? Al2O3 dot XH2O, which is incorporated. Here, how many do we have? You have three, so you can write this. So, this aluminium oxide, which is formed, is this Al2O3. This Al2O3 is further sent for smelting, which we do, or the process which is used, or the cell which we use for smelting is Hell Harold process. That's it. I'll be doing this in the next video. So simple. So this is your Bayer's process. Let us label this as Bayer's process. So Bayer's process for purification of aluminum. Right. Uh, so let us see. We've already done your uh, <coughs> Bayer's process, isn't it? Bayer's and Serpex process. So the aluminium trioxide which is obtained there in the Bayer's process, we take it further for smelting of aluminium. So let us see what is smelting process of aluminium. So now in smelting process, we are going to take an electrolytic cell, right? So I've already uh, drawn the electrolytic cell, right, to save time. So in this electrolytic cell, we very well know the two types of electrodes. One is your anode and your cathode. So let us write. So for smelting, the electrolytic cell has a cathode right and an anode so as soon as you write this please mention what is a cathode and anode so when i observe anode or is uh, this particular thing anode is made up of all carbon electrodes so carbon uh, electrodes that is your graphite so first most important it is carbon it is made up of carbon electrode or carbon rods graphite rods now when i come back to your cathode cathode we it's made up of an you know your iron vessel right thick outer lining is made up of thick iron vessel so i'll write it as iron vessel done this is a part of it so these are marked it as cathode <coughs> and which is made up of iron vessel now next important thing whenever you're doing smelting of uh, aluminium the most important thing or question asked is what is cryolite let us see so basically this uh, particular electrolytic cell when you pick up that aluminium oxide you're going to fuse that aluminium oxide with a uh, with cryolite what is that cryolite first you're going to fuse Al to O3, you're mixing with any 3 Al F6. So any 3 Al F6 is called cryolite. Okay, I'll tell you what is cryolite. What is the use of cryolite? Basically, your aluminium trioxide melting point is about 2000. Right. So, to reduce that fusion temperature, we try to add this cryolite. Cryolite is almost 1023 uh, or something. It is very less compared to aluminium. So, to reduce the fusion temperature, we try to add cryolite to this. So, if they ask you what is the use of cryolite, just try to reduce the fusion temperature. Now, after fusing these two together, let us start with the reaction. First important thing I am going to see, right, aluminium trioxide is first reduced with coke. So when it is reduced with coke, we very well know aluminium metal comes out and your carbon, it's converted to carbon dioxide gas. This is your solid. Done. Yes. Now, let us start with the cell reactions. Now, we very well know there are two types of electrodes. Yes. Now, first, let us divide the page. <clears throat> this is your overall reaction. I'm dividing the page into anodic uh, cell reaction and cathodic cell reaction. So, in the anodic cell reaction, we always know, now where is the anode? This is your anode part, all the car carbon rods. And this is your cathode part, this is this part, right? So, anode and the cathode. Now, anodic part, we very well know, always oxidation occurs. And cathode, always reduction process occurs. That. So, now what happens? <coughs> At the anode, oxidation means loss of electrons, reduction means gain of electrons. Now, now see, first important thing, I said your uh, carbon, whatever is there, is undergoing or it's, it is acting as an anode, I said. So now, come back at this anode, there should be some loss of electrons. So what a loss? This carbon is going to combine with the oxygen which is present here, right? This oxygen, whatever is present, that is going to combine of car uh, this carbon first, oxygen. So oxygen balance is minus 2. It's going to combine and form carbon monoxide. So two 
how many electrons are released two electrons are released so loss of oxygen it's a loss of electrons now further suppose if i take two moles of oxygen it's going to combine and form carbon dioxide and two into two four electrons are released yes now see how many two here so two done so this there is loss of electrons here at this part now now what happens from the anode the electron starts moving towards the cathode yes now what is there at the cathode gain of electrons i said so this gain of electrons which will accept those electrons important thing is now we very well know na3 alf6 isn't it now observe carefully na3 alf6 cryolite will break up into <coughs> na it's going to break up into two important thing right so uh, naf plus alf3 so how many nafs three nafs because sodium is this now this naalf3 further it's going to break up into al plus 3 plus 3 f minus done now this is your al plus 3 which is going to gain electrons so how are we going to write aluminium plus 3 will pick up three electrons and forms an aluminium metal this is how is your hal horals process just see again first what did we do we have got this <coughs> sorry we have got this aluminium trioxide from bayes process that bayes process i try to reduce it with your uh, coke when I try to reduce it with coke, it got converted to carbon dioxide. So let us balance this. We didn't balance this reaction. So if I write, suppose here, 3, 2s are 6. Okay. 3, 2s are 6. Suppose if I write 3 here. Now let us see. Um, 3, 2s are 6. Okay. 3 carbons done. 3, 2s are 6 done. So I have to write this is 2. Then this aluminium becomes 4. Now let us see if it's balanced. 2, 2s are 4. Done. 3, 2s are 6. Done. Or carbon 3. Done. Once it is done, we are going to take this whole thing in an electrolytic cell. There are two electrodes. One is your anode electrode, which is made up of graphite or carbon rods. And your cathode electrode, which is made up of iron vessel, outer, outer lining. We very well know anode, there is oxidation loss of electrons. At cathode, there is reduction of gain of electrons. Now, in the process, what am I going to do? I am going to fuse the particular thing, uh, aluminum trioxide with cryolite. Why did we fuse? I have to reduce the fusion temperature, the whole temperature, because melting point is already to about 2000 we want the metal to be extracted isn't it so i add cryolite once it is done divide the page into two equal halves one is your anodic reaction what is happening at anode you have your carbon electrodes so this carbon electrodes combines with the oxygen i have taken two options one is formation of carbon monoxide and form formation of carbon dioxide so here oxygen valency is two so two electrons here oxygen valency is two into two four electrons now on the other side, on the cathodic part, I said your cryolite is already there, Na3AlF6. This cryolite will dissociate into 3NaF. Just see Na3NF, 3 plus 3, 6. And AlF3. Done. Now, once AlF3 again further dissociates into cation and anion. Now this cation is going to gain electrons from here and form aluminium metal so this is your reduction process this uh, completes your smelting process of uh, uh, what do you say aluminium so when question is asked try to write aluminium smelting is done by hal herald process and this is further sent for refining Right, so let us see this famous question in your metallurgy. So, what is so the question? What does this to say? So basically, what do we do? We have already done Hall Herald's process. Done. So, in that, we have used a, a particular compound that is cryolite. Now, if this, that, this question is asked based on that concept, let us see. So, what is the role of cryolite and feldspar? They have asked. So, let us see. What is the formula for cryolite? Na3AlF6 is cryolite. You have to practice it, then only you will get it. Right. Feldspar formula is CaF2. Basically, when I see or prepare or when I have to prepare cryolite, first important thing, let us see how is cryolite prepared, and then I'll come back to the use. Cryolite. Preparation of cryolite. First, we are going to take feldspar. So, what is feldspar? CaF2. I am going to fuse it with sulfuric acid. 
when i'm fusing with sulfuric acid you get two compounds one is hydrogen fluoride i mean balancing the reaction just giving you general information and the leftover is calcium sulfate hydrogen fluoride and calcium sulfate now that hydrogen fluoride what do we do now i'm going to add two important oxides one is na2o and aluminum <coughs> al2o3 then you get a compound called na3 alf6 this is your cryolite this is what is your cryolite now this cryolite we are going to add it with aluminium trioxide or aluminium oxide in hal horol process what does it do in hal horol process first important condition is the whole cell or the electrolytic cell whichever uh, compound you are adding that whole electrolytic cell the liquid whatever electrolyte you are adding that liquid should be in the molten state so it should be in a molten state means these are the conditions based on these conditions we are we are going to add the cryolite next important thing whichever electrolyte you are adding it should be volatile the volatile condition it should not be volatile immediately as soon as you heat it it should be non volatile in the electrolytic cell so the electrolyte should be no it will not evaporate then only it will stay in perform the reaction next important thing it should be less denser low density that means it has to float above the metal next it has to conduct electricity if all these conditions are satisfied then only you're going to pick up that particular electrolyte so uh, and you know uh, to satisfy or when we see all these conditions the important or the compound which was found useful was cryolite why cryolite basically your <coughs> basically your cryolite melting point if i see it is 1012 degrees centigrade and if i speak about aluminium melting point is almost above those 2000 right so what happens when you are adding or fusing cryolite with aluminium first important thing cryolite starts or it will reduce the fusion temperature so it's going to first important function please note it this is where your answer lies it's going to reduce fusion temperature means when it is mixed with this fusion temperature from To three four three Kelvin to almost ten uh eleven hundred and forty Kelvin, right? So so much is the difference between this. So it's going to completely drop down the temperature so that the metal uh, metal does not melt in that particular temperature in the electrolytic cell. I can extract it further and then send it for refining. The next important thing, cryolite is going to help. Or the second important condition, it will conduct electricity. We have already seen, isn't it? I've seen shown the cell reactions in Hal Horol process. Please observe. So it conducts electricity. This is also one of the important functions of cryolite. If they ask you. Now, what is the use of feldspar? Feldspar also it further reduces the fusion temperature. If I have to write feldspar, further reduces, further reduces fusion temperature. So these are the two important applications: reducing the fusion temperature so that the metal doesn't melt, and further con conducting electricity in the cell so that there is exchange of electrons between the anode and the cathode. So let us see this famous question, which is asked under Hal Horol's process. So you hope you would have watched that video first. Watch that video, then you will understand this question. What did they ask us? Why is graphite preferred as anode electrode in Hal Horol process? Right. So basically, in Hal Horol process, we have two electrodes. One is your anode electrode, and the other is your cathode electrode. Right. So at anode, what was released? Oxygen gas was released. Right. Oxygen gas was released. Right. oxygen gas was released fine and cathode what was released aluminium metal was released this is what was we have seen the reaction cell reactions in hal horol process now what happens your oxygen gas whatever is there now i said what is a uh, electrode made up of anode is made up of graphite rod so anode is made up of your graphite rod or carbon rods okay carbon rods now what is your cathode made up of cathode is made up of an iron vessel this is what we have seen Now what happens? The oxygen which is released is going to combine with this carbon. So carbon, it's going to combine with carbon, forming carbon dioxide gas. And further, if I take two, this, 
here I'm going to pick up uh, suppose if I'm taking excess of oxygen now what do I get I get carbon monoxide so how many are here to two is a four if I take now here also excess I said four suppose <coughs> So this carbon dioxide, now let us see whether it is balanced or not, 4 and 4, okay. This carbon dioxide, what does it do? This carbon dioxide will start burning up, it will burn off that anode electron. So it will start eating up the anode electron, it starts burning away of anode electron, that is your graphite, so that is your carbon electrodes. Right. So, what do they do? They, you have to keep replacing it every time, isn't it? So, th that is the most important disadvantage. And next important thing, when I see at the cathode electrode, this oxygen, whatever is there, it will again combine with your already prepared aluminium metal, isn't it? That oxygen will again combine with your aluminium metal and will form aluminium. So, again the oxide form is back. So, most important thing, what should you do? You that is the reason we try or we try to use carbon electrodes. Why? It's the cheapest way. Already it is trying to burn off the anode electrode. So I am trying to use your graphite or carbon electrode because it is cheapest. First important thing, a very economical, though it is eating up, I can further again uh, reuse it and substitute the electrodes as and when it is required. So when this answer is given to you, try to write the reason first, try to write what is going to happen and try to write why is it used because it is economical in nature. So let us come back and we have already done uh, <clears throat> the isolation that is concentration methods then gradually we went into extraction methods then we went into smelting then we have done some questions on smelting now we'll end the topic with refining of aluminium so basically you're refining of aluminium uh, the process which or the electrolytic method which we use is called hoops electrolytic method right so and hoops electrolytic method the electrolytic cell basically when we observe that uh, electrolytic cell we always know you know it, it, it should have a cathode electrolytic cell is composed of a cathode anode and an electrolyte that's important now in hoops electrolytic pro method we are going to just uh, see what is an, uh, what is acting as an anode what is the electrolyte and what is acting as a cathode this is most important for you all so see now you you have seen the electrolytic cell in this electrolytic cell you have three electrodes connected these three electrodes where are they connected all these three electrodes are connected to the external circuit that is cathode right so most important thing in the cathode your pure aluminium acts as a cathode that's the first thing just see this layer now when I come down to the second layer that is your molten fluoride so let us write this as cathode upper layer this will be better for you upper layer now the uh, middle layer that is your electrolyte that is your middle layer and the last layer is the bottom layer I have written it in the reverse order okay bottom layer now let us see in the middle layer you have molten fluorides now here Along with this molten fluorides, you have fused aluminium also. Fused aluminium plus molten fluoride. So, the, the electrolyte here is fused aluminium plus metal fluorides of what? Or molten fluorides of what? Fluorides of aluminium, barium, sodium. Yes, all these fluorides are going to fuse together. That will be your middle layer which acts as an electrolyte. When I come down to the last layer, you have three important things impure aluminium metal plus you have silicon and copper alloy also right now so once again you have three layers yes first layer anodic layer uh, sorry cathodic layer first layer cathodic layer yes the second layer is the electrolyte and the third layer is this so don't get confused I've written in the reverse order this is one this is two this is three please uh, get uh, write it properly now what happens we very well know in hal harold process the amount of aluminium which is obtained so in hal harold process the amount of aluminium obtained is almost 99 percent pure 
Now, during this process of electrolysis, <coughs> uh, the amount of uh, impure aluminium, everything gets purified due to when they get exchanged with the opposite electrodes. And from here, from the bottom layer, the amount of aluminium is collected. And again, from the second, this is also collected. And finally, it is sent to the first layer. And then it is scrapped off. So, the amount of aluminium here by the process of hoops process, the amount of aluminium which we get is 99.98% pure. This is the perfection of this. So, this is what you are going to write in your hoops process. Simple, nothing to explain, no cell reactions for you all to study. Only thing you have to remember, as I have written reverse order, please don't go with this. Just write 1 here, 2 and 3. So, this comes down. I am sorry for this. This comes down. And finish up your answer. Right, so let us finish off this extraction of metallurgy of aluminium with this question. What does this question say? But still I have elegant diagram related to this. I'll, when I do the elegant diagram, I'll try to finish that part of aluminium in that. So what does it say? How is aluminium used in the extraction of copper, uh, chromium and manganese from their oxides? So basically they are asking us the uses of aluminium here. Now what should you remember? First most important, aluminium is a very good reducing agent, right? So just right, aluminium is a good reducing agent when it is a reducing agent what do we learn reducing agent are those which uh, themselves undergo or they get oxidized and reduce others yes so what happens here when i'm going to take oxides of chromium chromium oxide is cr2o3 manganese oxide is mn3o4 now when i'm going to add aluminium to this both i have to show the reactions isn't it now i said this is a reducing agent it itself gets oxidized aluminium gets itself gets oxidized too this is your chromium and al2o3 reducing agent now here also the same thing aluminium acting as a reducing agent so itself gets oxidized uh, and releases out manganese to its from its metal oxide to metal right so metal oxide to metal and aluminium gets oxidized this gets reduced and this gets oxidized that's it. So, the very important reducing agent factor. So, let me balance this. Okay, 2 and 2. Okay, this is balanced. Now, this is 3, isn't it? Mm, yeah, 3 if I take. Okay. Mm, this is 4 if I take. Yeah, this I take N, 8 and this is 9. Let us see if I have balanced. Manganese is 3, 3 is a 9. Then done. Oxygen, 4, 3 is a 12. Done, 4, 3 is a 12. Aluminium is 8 here, here 8. Oxygen is 4, 3. Yes, yes, this is how it's balanced. Done. Now, this one also. Aluminium is 2 here. Chromium is 2 here. Okay, done. So, this you can write this use uh, for aluminium. And one more thing you should remember. Aluminium is also used in aluminothermite process, which you have also seen. You can write that also. It is used in aluminothermite process for joining the railings yes one more session of your metallurgy chapter so till now we have done learned the extractions of iron then we have proceeded to the extraction of aluminium now let us come back and discuss the complete detailing of zinc extraction so whenever we speak about zinc as i said <coughs> whenever you're speaking about a metal you have to first Think about the extraction of the metal from the ore, which is what we have learned. It is an economical way of extracting metal from an ore. So, let us see what are the ores of zinc. So, when I speak about the ores of zinc, we have <coughs> zinc blend. This is the first ore which, through which we are going to use it in the process. That is the formula is ZNS. Then, we are going to use zincite, Z -Z -N -C -I -T -E, zincite, that is zinc oxide. I am going to use this also. Later, we are also going to use one more ore of zinc that is calamine, that is your zinc carbonate. So, the, so these are the three ores from which I can extract the metal. We will be following different procedures for extraction of metal. So, whenever we go into the metallurgy of zinc, the first important step is we are going to take these ores and we are going to concentrate the ore. So, the concentration methods of zinc is done by a process called froth flotation method froth flotation method that is what is the diagram which i have drawn here so this is your froth flotation method from the concentration methods we are going gradually going to take it for two important processes that is roasting and we are going to uh, take it for calcination 
for roasting and calcination roasting i'm going to take always sulfide oats roasting is done with the sulfide oats and calcination is always done with carbonate oats remember this after roasting and calcination we are going to take it for a process called extraction so whole i mean this is these are also part of extraction but we are going to further extract it by reduction process right so this extraction after extraction we are going to take it for refining in that refining we are going to do two types of two processes one is fractional distillation based on the boiling point fractional distillation and the second would be your electrolysis these two are the methods which i am going to explain so this covers the whole of zinc topic any question may be asked from any part of this particular topic so let us start with the first one so what am i going to do i am going to take these three oats and start with the first concentration method that is froth flotation method so let us write the heading for froth flotation so whenever we are writing froth flotation the key word which is present in the board marking scheme would be principle of froth flotation that is what is the heading the important part so let us write froth flotation flotation method now for froth flotation method the most important thing is <coughs> yes as i said principle now as you have seen this is your froth flotation tank which they are going to uh, take it or uh, administer for getting the collecting the water so in froth flotation tank what what do you have basically a froth flotation tank as a rectangular vessel okay that we are not bothered about that most important thing is you have a rotating paddle here that is the most important thing in this apart from the frothing agents so this rotating pa paddle continuously keeps rotating or that particular or whatever we have added so remember one rotating paddle to which air high pressure air is always circulated into the rotating paddle now what do we do we going to do from one side of the rectangular vessel we are going to introduce ore and oil right let us see what is that ore and oil why are we adding that and as i said this is introduced into the tank and this ore air as it enters into the tank the rectangular paddle keeps on rotating at high speed yes now we'll see what is going to happen inside the froth flotation tank now important thing is in a froth flotation method and the principle involved whenever you are writing that particular thing principle involved you have to write first important thing is preferential write this word that will give you the keyword whole topic preferential prefer preferential okay preferential wetting properties of the ore and gange particle gange particles with frothing agent frothing agents and and water okay this is what so what are we going to do we are going to basically pick up low grade sulfide ores so remember froth flotation method is basically administered for for what ores low grade sulfide ores so what are these so low grade sulfide ores are basically low grade means which are extracted from the earth's crust by mining right and later they are going to send it for smelting process that we have already learned right? smelting uh, converting the uh, getting the metal from metal oxide okay so low grade is basically extracting the metals from that particular earth's crust So now I'm I'm going to take these sulfide ores in froth flotation method. And what concept? I very well know. Along with ore, you also have gange particles, the impurities. Now what is the concept? We are going to take or we are going to wet both the sulfide ores and uh, the ore and the gange. Now in this concept, the ore particle gets wet with oil, and your gange particle gets wet with water. based on this concept only we are going to take so that is why we wrote preferential wetting properties of ore that is with oil and gange particles with water you have to remember this so whenever we are taking sulfide ores right what are the examples your best self example is zns i can take pbs right <clears throat> uh, so your uh, zinc blend i can pick up galena lead ore that also i can also take cu fes2 Cuprite, okay, or uh, copper pyrites, right? Huh? 
then i can also take iron pyrites fes2 all these can be used or this can be extracted or concentrated by this method next important thing for frog flotation method what what are the conditions or what what am i going to add the conditions are first important thing we are going to add different frothing agents which you have to write in the exam the first important thing which i am going to add is collecting agent right i am going to add this collecting agent the collecting agent which we are going to add in froth flotation is sodium ethyl xanthate this is the first collecting agent remember so to this particular thing i have to collect the ore separately isn't it now next important thing we are going to add very important agent that is froth like okay let us write froth first this is better froth we will have three types of frothing agents one is your froth stabilizers then i am going to add froth you can write all the three i am going to add frothing agents and also i am going to add froth to float to make that froth to float about froth to float of floating agents floating froth to float of floating agents so the froth stabilizer which i am going to add here is crisol crisol and aniline i am going to add these two next important for the frothing agents i am going to add pine oil for the froth to float above this layer i am going to add lime and sodium carbonate you have to compulsory write all these sodium carbonate so one is a collecting agent so two is your frothing froth stabilizers this is your three this is your four all the four are done i am going to add all now what happens once i add all these uh, four things into the container this air with high pressure is rotating or the paddle is rotating continuously the over and oil is introduced when it is rotated continuously the whole mixing part occurs in the particular tank once it is mixed what happens let us see this is one step this is the second step in the second step ore starts converting into colloidal particle all the ore gets the it forms a colloid you all very well know colloid isn't it colloid is a aggregation of molecules yes so your oil gets converted into colloid when you are supplying the air pressure colloid when air is supplied over so this gets colloid and slowly what happens you know because of these agents froth stabilizer frothing agent froth to float and all these and the collecting agents which are there in this they start collecting that froth and they form they get collected on the surface so you know you have all these bubbles is it this bubbles is, is made up of or it's containing the ore yes whatever ore sulfide ore whatever is we have added so now in the third condition is your fro your ore gets collected gets collected with oil and it floats and floats now what happened to the gange ma'am where is the gange now yes now the gange whatever is there the impurities they get wetted or they get mixed up with water that is your concept isn't it so ore gets collected with oil and floats and your gange gets collected with water and sinks gang is here ore is here done now what do they do they're going to collect this ore they're going to dry the ore completely and once they dry the ore they're going to collect that dried part and further send it for reduction or they further send it for no reduction i should not say i have further send it for calcination and roasting correct so now your gang is down ore is above that's done the final step is ore is dried and sent for roasting roasting and calcination that's it this is your froth flotation method your complete answer this is where you can get full marks right so now we, what did we do we have already concentrated the ore with the froth flotation method now we are going to take that concentrated ore which is dried up and allow it to undergo calcination and roasting so when they are asking you to differentiate calcination and roasting very simple question to answer let us see calcination remember c okay c means again carbonates we are going to write like this here carbonates are getting converted to their oxides 
remember that roasting is a process of converting sulfide ore or sulfides to oxides both are oxides but here we are going to roast sulfide ores only right when i have to write the definition of calcination let us say right the definition of calcination is it is a process of strong heating okay strong heating this is also the same definition it is a process of strong heating right strong heating of what strong heating of carbonate ores carbonate ores in the absence of air or limited supply of oxygen limited supply of oxygen below its below its melting point of fusion temperature remember not above that right now same thing process of strong heating of sulfide ores right in the presence of air now this is in the absence this is in the presence so you roast the roasting is in the presence of oxygen sulfide ores in the presence of air right or limited supply i said no or in the or supply excess or supply okay supply of air or oxygen below its melting point right. this is important so this is absence this is presence that is the only difference you have to write now so as i said here carbonates are getting converted to oxides sulfides are converted into oxides let us take the carbonate ore of zinc so the carbonate ore of zinc is calamine so i'm going to take calamine so calamine is zinc carbonate dissociate carbonate into oxides so break this one into zinc oxide yes the leftover is one oxygen has gone from here the leftover is carbon dioxide simple yes now 2 plus 1 3 zinc is one carbon is one balanced so this is your cal calcination now when i take roasting so roasting what it is i have to take sulfide ores so what is sulfide ores yes zinc blend correct so zinc blend i'm going to take zinc blend that is zinc sulfide now i'm going to add oxygen now there are two conditions here i can take zinc or uh, sulfide i can roast zinc sulfide with two moles i can roast zinc sulfide with three moles of oxygen now what happens when you roast zinc sulfide with two moles of oxygen i said sulfides will get converted to oxides so convert sulfides to oxides first now zinc oxide yes zinc oxide now what is left extra yes <coughs> sulfur 2 to the 4 isn't it now two moles i took so this becomes zinc sulfate remember that this is an exception here you have to remember that now two moles you get zinc sulfate now when i further heat it with higher state this becomes zinc oxide yes now the left over is sulfur dioxide yes. now let us see and uh, balance this now this is 3 to the 6 okay now if i write this as 2 okay if i write this as 2 if i write this as 2 okay. let us see if it is balanced or not sulfur is 2 yes done zinc is 2 done oxygen is 2 plus 2 2 to the 4 plus 2 6 3 to the 6 yes done so this is how we are going to roast 2 moles you get zinc sulfate three moles you get zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide this is what is called roasting and calcination so let us come back suppose if this question is asked extraction of zinc what did we do we have taken we have taken the ore of zinc then what did we do we have taken it for concentration methods by froth rotation from that i have taken that ore to roasting and calcination from roasting and calcination we are further going to reduce it and then do the purification process so they want us to explain at one stitch so let us do what how let us see how can i write this so explain the process of zinc in detail so when you are learning zinc in detail the first important thing you have to write extraction method so write the heading extraction <coughs> method for zinc right like this and after you write like that the first important method what do we do we have written or we have taken the ore so what are the ores which we have taken we have taken zinc sulfide we have taken zinc oxide and we have taken zinc carbonate so what is zinc sulfide zinc blend then we have taken zinc oxide that is zincite we have taken zinc carbonate that is calamine which we have already discussed now after this you are going to send it for concentration of the ores you are going to concentrate the ore so what is the method which you have done we have learned a method called 
called froth flotation method so you are going to write few points about froth flotation which i have shown about the frothing agents collecting agents what how, what is the principle of froth flotation just put it in five or six points here now after concentration you are going to take it for roasting yes this is one more method where you are going to roast the ore so what is roasting process as i said here in roasting the sulfide ores are converted into oxide ores so which which sulfide ore did we take we have taken zno this sulf uh, uh, sorry this is zns sulfide right so this sulfide ore i am going to roast it at two moles of oxygen and three moles this we have already done suppose if i take three moles of oxygen what do i get i get zinc oxide one oxygen and i am going to also get sulfur dioxide we have already done this reaction balanced reaction now after roasting remember you are going to write the definition also which i have already given done from roasting i am going to take it to a method called reduction reduction is also called smelting smelting process so what do we do in smelting we are going to use a reducing agent like coke or carb so for reduction or smelting pick up this metal oxide what is zno now zno is zincite now i am going to take uh, zincite here i took zinc blend here i am taking zincite to the zincite i am going to add coke now coke is what a reducing agent now suppose if i am taking 2 moles of the zincite yes now i said smelting or reduction is a process of removal or converting oxides to the metals correct yes so reduction is nothing but loss of oxygen so this oxygen is lost from here and what do i get i get zinc and how much what else do we get we get carbon dioxide just see zinc so two moles here carbon with oxygen to carbon dioxide gas so this is your reduction process now after reduction of smelting process i am going to take it for purification process so purification method so in this purification method i am going to show you two important concepts one is <coughs> fractional distillation method fractional distillation method where i am going to take all this particular zinc and different different metals in that based on the i am going to separate based on the difference in boiling points after that i am going to show you what is electrolysis method with this i'm done with the purification of zinc then we'll fi uh, finish off the uh, thing uh, uh, metallurgy of zinc with your uses so i i, I still have something left to discuss with uh, iron copper and zinc what is that that is your elegant diagram that is the uh, metallurgical concepts electro me hydrometallurgical concepts of that and electrochemical aspects of that i'll be doing under elegant diagram all the questions which are asked for your metallurgy so let us do fractional distillation electrolysis now Right. Let us come back and see the purification techniques of uh, zinc. So what do we say in purification techniques? We are going to follow two important methods. One is a fractional distillation method, and one would be your electro refining method. So basically, whenever I speak about fractional distillation method, I have drawn a diagram here, a layout for you to understand. But remember, please don't practice diagrams for your exam. Diagrams are not asked in your exam, right? For us, the concept and principle is important. So when we speak about fractional distillation, it is basically the process of distillation or separating based on the boiling points correct so what do we do we have two fractionating columns one fractionating column here one fractionating column and you have a condenser which is attached now when you are taking a mixture of gases a mixture of metals now we have a mixture of zinc cadmium iron arsenic and lead i have to purify zinc so what are we going to do when we are trying to send these combustion gases high temperature the metal whatever is there the liquefied metal whatever is there that or the metal first if i say solidify this one solid metal it gets started it starts uh, becoming or gets converted into according to the boiling point it starts converting into vapors done these vapors are they pass it through this fractionating or the fractionating column because of the condenser which is present it tries to condense and get formish forms liquid right which is further solidified now what do we do we are going to take this boiling point into consideration so when i see these boiling points now suppose i started heating 1 degree 200 500 600 like that when i reach 613 degree centigrade first arsenic is going to come out it's going to condense and we collect arsenic okay right we'll write, suppose let us write on this at uh, 613 arsenic is out after that at uh, after 613 when we are going to reach a temperature of 767 your cadmium is out 
done after 767 you have your zinc so we very well know zinc boiling point is 907 degree now this zinc goes or they try to they send it through a different fractionating column where it gets condensed and finally at 700 degrees you get zinc which is 99.9% pure now later when this particular boiling point from 900 if it reaches to 1700 your lead is out when it reaches to your um, 2860 to 6 uh, 6 uh, 2860 degrees your iron is out so all these metals uh, the impure metals are collected to one side and your pure metal zinc is separated out which is uh, your this is the purification technique so first write the definition try to note remember these boiling points and see at what temperature which is coming out that is your impure metal and your pure metal is separate come back students to one more session of your metallurgy chapter so till now what did we learn we have already learned the extraction process of iron then gradually i went into extraction of aluminium i have divided into different different sub topics because so that it's easy for you to learn for the exam suppose if i do it at a stretch all the uh, things in one particular video it would be very difficult and the retention capacity also would be very less for you all right now after aluminium then i've gone to the extraction of zinc now let us come back and do the extraction or the metallurgy of copper so very well know whenever we are learning extractions of particular metal we have to go according to the procedure isn't it the first important thing i have to pick up the ore yes so the ore of copper which we are going to learn or <coughs> which we are going to discuss is okay we are going to discuss or pick up the ore of copper that is your uh, copper cuprite right let us uh, say the first ore which i am going to learn is cuprite so cuprite formula okay let me make this a bit bigger yes cuprite is cu2o then the, the ore which of copper which we are going to use is copper glance copper glance copper glance is cu2s and after that which i am going to use in this process is chalcopyrite chalcopyrite the formula for this is cu fes2 i'll be using this chalcopyrite in all the metallurgical uh, processes so please practice the practice the formulas first so that whenever i'm using chalcopyrite it is easy for you all now these three ores done what am i going to do we are going to take this ores and send it for grinding first when you're sending it for grinding it is crushed into smaller pieces of a size of less than 100 mu micron done from this grinding tank it's gradually then taken into your froth flotation tank now we are going to do the concentration methods in that concentration methods <coughs> we are going to do froth flotation method so for froth flotation what do we learn froth flotation basically is used for sulfide ores so i am going to use the sulfide ore that is copper uh, uh, glance or copper pyrites so the sulfide ores are concentrated here so when you are writing this concentration method for froth flotation watch the video for froth flotation and you can include those points here it is the same but only thing is you'll write about copper sulfide now the other method which other than sulfide ores they're going to get concentrated by method called gravity separation method so based on the weight of the ore we are going to separate by gravity separation method done from this concentration method now please remember you have to write the points of froth flotation from this concentration methods we are going to take this particular ore yes to a process called <coughs> observe carefully roasting yes here we very well know roasting is a process of converting sulfide ores to oxide ores so roasting you are going to take it for conversion of i shall write sulfide ores to oxide ores okay oxide ores now simple once roasting is done i'm going to take it or uh, this proceed to the next step here very important that is smelting now basically mam what is the difference with the smelting what is smelting the, uh, actually smelting is a conversion of the metal oxide into its metal that is you are obtaining the metal from its metal oxide done so but here you have to remember especially in copper we are not going to reduce or we are not going to, we are going to take carbon as a reducing agent but we don't we are not going to convert copper oxide directly to copper so here we are going to prepare or convert it into into a, uh, a compound called copper matte very important i'll be discussing that copper matte yes so smelting process is done here in smelting two important things are going to happen first 
the copper is going to i said formation of copper mati and conversion of iron oxide to slag so smelting process formation of copper mati and conversion of iron oxide to slag will be doing that now once cost melting is done <coughs> we are going to proceed uh, to an important method right so in this melting only we have one more part where your uh, copper mati after that it is undergoing or uh, undergoing process called auto reduction we will see this auto reduction once auto reduction is done that is what we get the copper copper that uh, 95 percent copper that auto after auto reduction the 95 percent copper is taken for refining there are two methods of refining for copper what are the two methods one method is called polling right so polling is a process which which is used it was used in olden days where they used to take the green wood or uh, logs of wood for reducing this copper oxide or reducing that copper right i i'm going to use one more method that is electro refining this is you have studied this in your grade 10 electro refining process where you use the impure anode and the pure cathode yes so i'm going to use that also so this is the whole layout of your copper metallurgy so let us come back and meet with your Okay, I, I hope you can, uh, there's nothing to write in this. This method also for rotation or gravity separation based on the way they are separated. I will not be discussing uh, uh, with this concentration method. I will be directly going into a concept called roasting of copper ore. So, we have already started with this copper uh, layout. We have already shown, I have completely shown a layout of your copper extraction. So, what do we say when such question is asked? This is the extraction of copper from copper pyrites. That is your chalcopyrite. How should you start your answer? Now, the first most important thing is, whenever some extraction process is asked to you, first start with the ore. So, we said ore. Right. So, what are we going to do? We are going to take the ore first. So, as I said, copper pyrites. So, write that formula. Copper pyrites. So, copper pyrites or chalcopyrites is the same. The formula for this which you are going to take is UFES2. Now, this particular ore, I said we are going to send it for grinding. So, when you are grinding it, less than 100 mu micron. Done. <coughs> Please write few points about this. How it's taken, grinded it to find this one. Dust particles are removed. Sand is also removed. That's done. After grinding, we're going to send it to a method called concentration method, and you will write froth flotation, froth flotation method. So in this froth flotation method, what are you going to write? Please add some points. And you, I only took this video of froth rotation. It's the same thing. What are the different uh, collecting agents, frothing agents? Please mention all the points. Right now, after froth rotation, I said we are going to take it to a process called uh, ro roasting. Let us write the reactions for roasting. So now, roasting, I said it is heating in the presence of oxygen. Correct. Yes. Now you are going to pick this ore first take this ore now in roasting cu fe s2 now i'm going to take two moles of this when i'm going to take two moles of this i'm going to heat it in the presence of oxygen when you heat it this copper uh, just uh, decomposes or it forms sulfide ores of one one compound would be sulfide ore of copper the second compound would be sulfide ore of iron two important things first one sulfide ore of copper c to s sulfide ore of iron fes now here i have taken two so you're writing two here and the leftover because there are two to the four isn't it now two to the four sulfur one has come out and one more sulfur has come out is two moles the leftover there's one sulfur that comes out as sulfur dioxide yes done so now we are going to take that copper sulfide and allow it to react with oxygen because it is a roasting process so when the roasting process just observe you're going to get two first important thing copper oxide this gets oxidized to cu2o and the sulfur comes out as further sulfur dioxide done so let us balance so suppose if i take two here if i take three here if i take two here if i take two here let's see copper four yes done then oxygen is okay sulfur how many here two here also two oxygen how many three to six here two to four six here done so this is your roasting let us roast iron sulfide ore i'm going to take fes i'm going to add oxygen to this 
it's the same story again iron or uh, sulfide gets gets oxidized because you are roasting it it becomes feo and the leftover comes out as sulfur dioxide gas it's the same balancing again 2 3 2 and 2 see let us see iron 2 oxygen 6 here also oxygen 6 and sulfur 2 so this is your roasting process once this roasting process is complete we are going to send it send this ore now we have to concentrate more on this oxide copper oxide and iron oxide we are going to send it to a process called smelting Now observe carefully. Your smelting process here, normally in other uh, uh, metals, metal extraction, we always used to add copper, uh, carbon, coke, right? Coke, which acts as a reducing agent. Here also, we are going to add coke. But along with coke, we are going to add silica. Means that silica add means that silica is already present as an impurity. So we are going to add coke, and we are also going to add silica. Now observe, concentrate more on this. This is your main product, which we have to further convert it into metal. Take that copper oxide, and this is going to react with iron sulfide. I'll tell you why am I taking iron sulfide here. Now this iron sulfide, just observe the, carefully. Your iron oxide and copper sulfate double displacement reaction. So you, you'll get Cu two S plus iron oxide. We're done. Now <clears throat> this iron oxide is going to combine with your silica. Yes. So take. Let us write this reaction first. FeO plus SiO two gives me FeSiO three. This is your slag. That is the reason we use iron oxide here. That comes out as a slag, so that I can easily wash it off from that particular metallurgical tank. Right. So slag, right, it can be easily removed. Now here, the silica is acting as an acidic flux. Remember that. That is the main reason we use silica. It's acting as an uh, acidic flux, and this becomes a basic flux, and finally remove it in the form of a slag or silicate salts. Done. Now we are left with this, isn't it? Copper sulfide. Just observe this copper sulfide C to S. Further, when you are sending a, a blast of uh, oxygen to this, yes. Now <coughs> this oxygen, whatever is there, just observe. This again gets converted. To Cu2O and further whatever leftover um, uh, sulfur dioxide is there that comes out as vapors. So again, we'll come back and do the bismerization process. Yes. So what have we learned? We have already seen the uh, roasting process and smelting process of co uh, copper. Now what do they do? They go to pick this uh, iron oxide, okay, the sediments of iron oxide which are there, and also they want to take that copper oxide which is formed. So please watch the earlier video and then come back to this video, otherwise there will be confusion for you all. So this they're going to take those two oxides, yes, and they're going to introduce this in your uh, bismuth converter. So this is called bismuth converter, on the process is called bismerization, bismuth uh, bismerization, bismerization is a process, and we are going to and the converter which is used is called bismuth converter. Bismuth converter. So, what I'm going to do in what? Let us see the reactions which are going to happen in this bismuth converter. So, most important thing is they are again just like your iron blast furnace, as I've shown in the diagram. But please remember, don't practice the diagrams. The diagrams are not required to be drawn in the exam. It is only for your clear understanding. Yes. So, in the bismuth converter, you have tire tires, as we have seen in uh, blast furnaces of iron. At the base of the blast furnace, you add tires from which the hot blast of air entered. Isn't it? So the tires are only for the uh, hot air uh, with uh, to enter into the tank. Now, this whole bismuth converter is lined with silica. That's very important because uh, there's one question also asked, which I'll be doing. Why? What is the use of silica in the bismuth line converter? Right. So now this uh, the whole bismuth converter is lined with silica, and you have tires for the hot air to enter. Now you're going to take the molten matty. Now what is matty? Basically, your molten matty or the matty means it, it's a mixture of Cu2S and little amount of FeS. This is your molten matty. Right, so that conversion which I have done in the earlier uh, video. So whenever they ask you what is matty, matty is a, a mixture of copper sulfide with little of iron sulfide. Now and silica also taken. Well, let us see the reactions. Now we said FeO whatever was there in the earlier uh, this one that combines with sand. The leftover 
and this is your SAN. It comes out as Fe SiO3 slag. This is done. This is removed. Now we also have copper oxide. Now copper oxide, what do we show? It's further going to because hot air is entering into the tank from this tires. So this is going to combine with copper oxide and forms your uh, no i should uh, not take this enough have to take copper sulfide isn't it yes copper sulfide yes remember that so because copper sulfide was has formed in the earlier thing so i'm going to take copper sulfide and heat in the presence of uh, oxygen this gets converted to cu 2 o and sulfur dioxide gas so this is again 2 3 2 and 2 which we did earlier now, at this particular process, observe, here what are we doing? We are going to take this molten metal, that is what we have written, molten matter. This molten metal, when you are trying to solidify, so let us write this as molten metal. And now here, what am I going to do? I am trying to solidify this metal. Solidification happens, right? You are trying to extract that metal, solidify. When this is, when the process of molten metal getting converted to solidification or solidifying, what gas is evolved? Sulfur dioxide gas is evolved. Now, this sulfur dioxide gas, what does it do? It tries to come out or because suppose if you take consume this as a metal, the sulfur dioxide gas comes out, tries to come out of this metal surface. When it is trying to come out of the metal surface, it try it forms blisters on the metal like this, blisters. So, that is the reason this metal or this metal oxide with sulfur dioxide is called blister copper. Remember, sulfur dioxide comes out in the form of blisters during the formation or during solidification and that blist that particular copper which is 99% pure is called blister copper so this whole thing is called blister copper remember now after this blister copper is formed we still have not got the copper metal there is an important process which you have to remember here this copper oxide and this sulfur uh, copper sulfide they undergo a process called auto reduction this is very important this is how your copper is obtained not like earlier one auto reduction process copper oxide and copper sulfide so copper sulfide plus copper oxide you go to mix they are going to act as auto reduction process they only uh, each uh, both of them get uh, act as a uh, re reducing agents and reduce that copper and sulfur dioxide is out so this copper comes out as two copper and your sulfur dioxide gas comes out Yes. So, now the most important thing you have to remember here is this copper is still, we still, it is not completely uh, uh, pure, you you are going to send it for further refining. So, auto reduction, you hope you have understood this. Next is your blister copper formation and slag formation. So, let us meet again with the refining process of copper. we've uh, almost done like your smelting is done your elect, uh, your process of obtaining blister copper is also done now let us come back and see the refining of copper so basically refining of copper which we've got as a blister copper that is 99 percent pure we're going to further purify it and get the metallic copper which we are uh, like which that is the main aim of extracting copper isn't it so refining of copper is studied under two headings one is your polling method and electro refining suppose if the, the definition of polling is asked if they ask you what is polling just write the definition it is polling is a process of converting metal oxide metal oxide into metal using green wood logs okay what does what does it mean right. green wood logs now basically earlier uh, when this electrolytic refining method was not used they used to pick up this copper oxide whatever we have gotten earlier uh, this uh, process they would they, uh, they used to take this copper oxide and uh, they're going to introduce or they're going to sprinkle some cop carbon powder on that so what is the use of carbon powder it acts as a reducing agent now they after uh, sprinkling copper powder on that they used to collect the green uh, trees or green wood right so the sap whatever is there inside that green wood right they're going to take that green uh, recent trees and place it on the wooden logs 
right so once this is placed on the wooden logs and this particular metal lore also with the carbon powder they used to pl place it on that wooden uh, log and finally when this started heating or combusting right so the height the particular sap i said it is acting as a reducing agent now we very well know when they combust they're going to release hydrocarbons from that that hydrocarbon is going to reduce the copper oxide into copper so once again simple Poling is a process of converting metal oxide, copper oxide to metal using green wood logs. Now, sir, nothing to write in the exam. Write the definition and just write hydrocarbons released from green wood logs reduces copper oxide to metallic copper. That's it. So, when you're writing this story or something, it is understood that you have understood the concept. Done. So, after this particular thing, uh, and you can also write, um, which, which one you'll write, here, ore is covered with, covered with carbon powder. This is important because this also acts as a reducing agent. Done. Right. Now, let, this is your polling process because they are placed in your placed on the wooden logs and poles, you know, that is why it's called as polling. When we come back to electro refining, most important thing in electro refining process, as I said, you have three things anode, you have to speak in terms of anode, you have to speak in terms of cathode, and you have to speak in terms of electrolyte. Correct? Yes. Here, the anode which you are going to take always, as I have shown in the earlier video also for zinc, right? Anode is always impure metal. Impure metal acts as anode. So, now this is your anode. Correct? So, anode positive and your cathode negative. The impure metal acts as anode and your cathode, the pure metal acts as cathode. Now, the electrolyte, pure metal. Okay, I'm sorry, pure metal. So, and the electrolyte which I'm going to take here. Yes, and I'm going to take an electrolyte here. That is your copper sulfate. And the electrolyte, the same salt you will be taking. So, that, you know, exchange of ions is also easy. So, the electrolyte which I'm going to take is a solution of copper sulfate. Right. We very well know in the earlier zinc, I added sulfuric acid for increasing the conductivity of the whole solution. Yes. Now, <clears throat> after taking this copper sulfate, when the electrolysis process occurs, we very well know electrons move from anode to cathode, isn't it? Yes. Now, with this particular copper sulfate, which is here, yes. Now, the pure metal, as in when the electrolysis process occurs, the pure metal goes and settles. That's done. Now, during this process, I said, this is the impure metal. And once the process, whole process is complete, the whole impurities, whatever are there, they come and settle down and this becomes thinner and thinner. And this becomes thicker and thicker. Okay. So, the impurities which come and settle here, this is like this, isn't it? The impurities which come and settle here include... Uh, tin, selenium, tellurium, silver, gold and platinum. The trace amounts are collected because they are collected below the anode. It is called anode mud. Anode mud. So, anode mud contains tin, selenium, tellurium, silver, gold and platinum traces. Yes, all the impurities on this side and the pure electrode or cathode, uh, you will have the pure metal which can be scraped off and used it for further use. We have already seen the extraction of copper. Please go through all the videos and then come back to the frequently asked questions. So, I have listed out few frequently asked questions. These questions are the same in all the books, whichever you see. Not more than that. Your board will not ask you more than that. But you have to have a clarity of all the subtopics of copper. Right. So, let us see the FAQs asked in copper metallurgy. So what is matty and give its composition? Okay. Right. So, we have already seen this. What is matty? Matty or copper matty? <clears throat> As I said in um, your smelting process yeah, before instead of uh, reduction with carbon and your silica we are going to convert it into copper matty and that copper matty is further sent for uh, sent into the bessemer converter yes that is what we've studied so let us write copper matty is if you write the answer basically it is mm, the molten form of copper sulfide with little amount of 
iron sulfide so i'm again stressing please watch the earlier videos and then come to faqs otherwise you'll not understand the concept of what am i teaching so if you have to write its composition your copper mate okay copper sulfide cu2s plus fes this is your copper mate done so what is the role of silica in metallurgy of copper now <clears throat> whenever we speak about silica where did we use silica we have used silica in your uh, i think yeah after roasting process when we came to your smelting process i used silica yes now let us see silica when you are writing such answers first try to write silica acts as acidic flux okay write it in capital letters because if this is for one mark write it as capital letters acidic flux what actually is acidic flux now so acidic flux is something which we obtain it from lewis acids okay what are lewis acids like your hcl h3po4 your uh, uh, sulfuric acid and all these are lewis acids if you obtained that from your lewis acid we call it as acidic flux so what are different examples of acidic flux acidic fl flux if i take examples your sio2 is an acidic flux okay let me come back to this and teach you basic flux calcium oxide magnesium oxide iron oxide uh, yeah if i take this acidic flux and if i take this basic flux if i add both i'm going to get a slag right now what are we going to do in metallurgy of uh, um, your uh, copper i'm going to take the silica and i'm going to add it to feu so here feo plus sio2 it combines to form a slag fe sio3 this is your slag now what is this now this is flux what is this now this is gange i already said gange plus flux gives us slag so this is also a basic flux yes remember this so i have uh, written uh, uh, this example taken this example you can just uh, uh, finish up yeah <clears throat> let us come back to the next question what the how is copper put in silica line converter that is your bessemer converter they are asking why is it taken or why are we lining the bessemer converter with silica so the most important thing in bessemer converter what what are we taking we are going to take in bessemer converter so let us write in bessemer converter we have two important things from smelting you have got it to bessemer converter so you are going to take your iron oxide correct and now you are also going to take your uh, copper oxide yes now iron oxide whatever you have taken that combines with the silica which is there in the lining so here the silica is going to act as a flux so what is the role of silica so silica as i have written here acts as flux fine so this silica is going to combine with your iron oxide and come out as slag so that is the reason they are, they are, they pick up silica in the lining yes so copper oxide okay not a problem here uh, copper oxide i said further uh, it undergoes reduction cu2s I said copper plus sulfur dioxide. This also happens, but we are bothered about this concept. This is what is your slag formation. So basically, converter basically for converting the iron impurity into slag. That is why we line it with silica. So let us see uh, next uh, FAQ question asked in copper metallurgy. So what do they give us? How is leaching carried out in case of low grade copper ores? I already said what are low grade copper ores. Low grade copper ores are those which you extract it from the earth's crust by mining. Right? And further as I said we are going to follow the procedure and finally smelt it to get the particular copper metal. Whichever metal you are uh, trying to extract. So now they said low grade copper ore. So this is also extracted from the earth's crust by mining. Yes done. So we have already seen the ores. Now first when I ask this question try to write the definition of leaching. When I have to write the definition of leaching just start your answer. Leaching is a process of extraction of which one of metal by dissolving in like every for every metal there is a specific leaching agent okay dissolving in acids or dissolving in leaching agents 
right so in this way now after you bleach what will happen to the impurities the impurities are going to get they settle in the form of sludge that is undissolved part of your uh, or the impurities of that particular metal so you can also write the let us write this is one let us write this is two undissolved part undissolved part settles as sludge okay let us write one right let us write one equation so that you will understand now suppose if i have to take the leaching of copper because they have asked me to explain in copper terms copper i'm going to use the leaching agent here is dilute sulfuric acid so now this is your leaching agent what will happen we very well know copper sulfate forms and water now this is your leaching agent now suppose as i've seen in aluminium extraction aluminium oxide ore is al2o3 what is the leaching agent which we have used we have used sodium hydroxide there it is specific to the particular metal now this is your leaching agent this forms a complex that is NaAlO2 that is sodium meta aluminate that is what we have studied sodium meta aluminate that's it so this is you have to write your answer like that then only your complete one mark is allotted to this question yeah. now next question is at a site at a site low grade copper okay there is a low grade copper kept along with that zinc and iron scrapes are also kept right why do we use scrap scrape scrape because the surface area is very high in them then the reactivity also will be very high which would be suitable as reducing agent now what is the criteria for deciding the reducing agent we normally go with the electrode potential values that is what you have studied in electrochemistry we have a series called electrochemical series where we are going to decide which is which will uh, which will act as a better reducing agent now i picked up this list because they have asked me which is a better reducing agent i picked up the electrode potential values now as i see the electrode potential value of copper now they said copper is there among zinc and iron which will reduce this I have taken two copper electrode potential values and the next would be this iron and this. As we go above, remember, as we go above in the electrochemical series, the reducing capacity or the reducing property increases. I am going above, from below to above, the reducing property increases, this way oxidizing property increases. So I am going above, just see, now copper, which is above copper, iron, compared to iron, which is above iron, zinc. So zinc electrode potential is minus 0.763, higher the reduction potential, better is the reducing agent, simple. So you have to write, higher reduction potential better reducing agent agent reducing agent right higher reduction potential means here what is the value what did we write here zn plus 2 by zn is minus 0.763 so which is greater than your iron fe plus 2 by fe how much is it minus 0 0.44 so what is the answer now zinc acts as acts as better reducing agent for copper that's it this is your answer full one mark allotted for this answer right let us do the next epic equation in copper metallurgy what is blister copper if they ask us right we've already done this question in uh, copper metallurgy that is your bismarization process so you have to just write blister copper is uh, okay let us write the answer in this way blister copper is formed blister copper is formed is formed during when is it formed? It's formed basically during conversion of the molten metal of copper formed during conversion, conversion of molten copper oxide into or copper metal will write better copper metal conversion of copper sulfide I should write isn't it because from copper sulfide only we will convert it into copper oxide so molten copper sulfide to copper oxide right now this is basically now let us write the reaction copper sulfide cu2s when it combines with oxygen yes in the bismuth converter this is going to form copper oxide plus sulfur dioxide 
this is what you have studied yes so this copper oxide plus sulfur dioxide what did we say this is your molten form this is your uh, your solidification part we are trying to solidify it solidified part so this part when it is trying to solidify sulfur dioxide comes out in the form of blisters it tries to escape out from the copper metal and then when it is trying to escape it tries to form blisters or you know bubble type on that um, uh, copper metal that's why we call it as blister copper so this particular thing you can write sulfur dioxide tries to escape from copper oxide in the form of blisters hence called blister copper and blister copper that's it which is 98 percent pure now done now what is anode mud we have already done this question anode mud we speak in terms of electrolytic refining of copper so you can write anode mud is formed is formed in electrolytic refining of copper right so impurities like during electrolysis we said you impurity uh, impure uh, metal is taken as a anode and pure is taken as a cathode so during that impurity what are the impurities which we see we want to see silver gold trace amount trace amount not uh, kg kilos and kilos kilograms trace amount of silver uh, gold platinum antimony uh, tin okay copper and not copper shouldn't be there yes all these trace amount are obtained uh, below the anode uh, uh, this is an electrode so these are called as anode mud yes and like this one, are obtained below anode called anode mud that's it this is your answer right done simple answer now what is polling i already did this polling is a process of extracting metal from the metal oxide using green wood poles right green wood or log green uh, logs and everything here we are going to take the metal we are going to powder it with carbon uh, powder which acts as a reducing agent and i already explained again you are going to take a green uh, trees and place it in the wooden logs so once it starts uh, burning off you get the hydrocarbon release of hydrocarbons this hydrocarbon is going to reduce your copper oxide to copper so you can watch the video for this watch the refining of copper so let us come back and start with the refining techniques of your metallurgy chapter till now we have learned extraction of your iron we have learned extraction of zinc aluminium copper silver yes all these are covered in a very detailed way and let us come back and almost we are coming to the end of the chapter <clears throat> refining techniques so when you speak about refining techniques we your, your uh, ncrt book has a list of refining techniques so that includes electrolytic reduction i've already done this electrolytic reduction which is numbered uh, under video 16 please watch that video for electrolytic reduction after that i also did the distillation process distillation process which is numbered under video number 13 you can watch it you have a clear explanation of distillation process in that now let us come back to the next concept that is zone refining so when i speak about zone refining the metals which can be extracted through zone refining basically refining when we say it is the pure purification technique isn't it we're going to get the crystal clear part of that particular metal after your concentration methods froth rotation methods smelting reduction all these so this is the final method of refining the particular metal so the metals which i can extract through zone refining are germanium silica gallium and this is germanium arsenide okay the uh, the alloy formation and indium and antimony combination i can extract all this so what is the principle which we are going to follow in zone refining first most important thing is the impure uh, metal whatever is there that impure metal is made in the form of a rod so impure metal is made in the form of a rod and second important thing around the rod you have circular heaters electrical heaters which keep rotating along this you have rotating circular heaters around this below this you have rollers and this rod keeps rotating over that and the circular coil keeps on heating the rod so what principle is followed in this basically the principle of solubility so solubility of or solubility of solid state 
and the liquid state of the ore this is what is taken into consideration here in liquidation we speak in terms of boil, melting points here we are going to speak in terms of solubility so what happens when the rod is moving in this direction okay when the roller is moving in this direction now all the metal or the impure impurities which are present in the metal right they also move along with this roller right so once they move along with this roller as in when the stroller moves down and down all the impurities get collected to one side just see now, now they have taken impure germanium rod here now as the direction of this metal or the roller is in this direction all the impurities start settling here right now as in when this roller moves to this towards this direction the leftover part now all the um, um, impurities get collected on one side and the leftover pure metal get recrystallized here so it forms a thick or oh, suppose here till here it's getting uh, recrystallized in pure metal and this part of the metal is cut and that's the purest form which is used further so one concept the solubility of the impurity as well as your uh, molten metal so if i speak about the impurity impurities are on one side of the rod and the molten metal uh, the pure metal gets recrystallized in one side so this is one part which is cut and which is done in zone that's called zone refining done so next important thing when we speak about liquidation basically through liquidation process i can refine tin lead and bismuth now what is the process here or the principle here the principle is based on based on difference in melting points this is important difference in melting point here we took solubility so what are they going to do they are going to introduce suppose if you want to purify a lead right they are going to take that impure metal along with impurities and they allow the metal to go now the, here this is your heating furnace they are going to heat this furnace regularly so now when impure metal is dropped in into this when the heating furnace the whole furnace is getting heated we said based on the difference in melting point here the impurity impurity mp would be high and the ore particle mp would be low so this is the concept so when they take the impure metal when this is heating i said the ore particle in melting point is low the ore that particular ore melts and it converts into a liquid form and which is collected so your pure metal is collected here and the leftover impurities because the melting point is very high they because once we collect the metal this is removed and the leftover impurities are or they they uh, just uh, are present at this particular part which can be discarded right so simple logic melting point difference both the difference first the ore is collected next is a impurity which is collected but only thing they do is they're going to convert or they're going to take it in a sloping hearth so it's easy for the metal to flow so again uh, let us come back and see the next technique that is your chromatographic technique and uh, your uh, van urkel process after your uh, <clears throat> uh, liquidation method let, let us see the next refining technique so this refining technique is called vapor phase refining so what is the concept here the concept is the metal getting converted into molten state okay so the metal get converted into a molten state right so or, or and this molten state when it is getting converted that's volatile in nature and this volatile uh, metal and further when it is decomposed yeah when this is further decomposed Post, then it's allowed to decompose again it forms the metal this is your concept so basically you have two types of uh, methods to explain this so that method for the first method is <coughs> we are going to prepare using Mons method and the second method is van Erkel's method van Erkel's method Mons method is used to prepare nickel metal right so Mons is for nickel refining van Erkel is for zirconium refining first i'm going to take nickel i'm going to add carbonyl to this suppose if i'm adding four moles of this i'm going to get a complex that is nickel tetracarbonyl a coordinate complex this i'm going to heat it as 350 to 370 kelvin now further this complex suppose if you're heating it further higher temperature that is uh, your uh, 450 to 470 kelvin again this decomposes to form nickel and your carbonyl is out this is your mons process simple just write the reactant form the complex again the reactants are back now in man process the same thing here i'm going to take zirconium i have to purify find that 
and we are going to add iodine to this so i'm going to add two moles so two to the four isn't it this one on heating it forms zirconium complex so that is zr i4 okay i can write it like this zr i4 now when you are further heating it this again decomposes into the earlier one that is your metal back to metal zirconium plus 2 iodine that's it is refining simple methods only thing you have to remember metal getting converted into complex complex further decomposing into metal and the uh, other reactant now let us come back to chromatographic methods so basically your chromatography or chroma means color yes and your graphy means writing graphy means writing so what do we do you have two different phases like you have basically you have many types of chromatography tlc technique paper chromatography glass chromatography column chromatography yes now here for you you have column chromatography for a column chromatography you're going to take a column a glass column rather and you have two important things to write, write remember first is your adsorbent and your adsorbate okay uh, suppose like if you can also call it as uh, mobile phase okay eluent right your adsorbent is always the stationary phase remember that adsorbent b e n t means stationary phase stationary phase and your adsorbate is your mobile phase Okay, uh, now basically suppose uh, you if you have like this now this is a duster isn't it the base part right this this base part is the standard one means the stable one that base part is called the adsorbent and the uh, dust particle or whatever is there above is the adsorbent yes now what happens here we are going to separate the mixture of compounds based on their mobility yes so what happens is suppose uh, i'm going to take a stationary phase like al2o3 right it's fixed here now whichever mixture you have to separate you're going to introduce it to the glass roll right now that mobile phase keeps moving in like uh, according to the mobility it moves into the uh, glass column and they get collected according to the mobility under different pigments suppose i'm separating pigments so different pigments get collected according to the colors and they form bands like this one band here one more band here one more band so this is red blue pink green like that different bands of colors right right based on because when you take pigments now these bands what do we do once they get collected because the mobility is different isn't it one moves the mobility of the ion is very fast it first comes and settles next would be the next one next would be the next one next would be the next one like that based on the mobility once they get fixed i'm going to open this particular plug and collect one one component based on that color this one and uh, finally separate the components so this is your basic very simple thing only thing you have to remember is adsorbent um, uh, this is your mobile phase this is your stationary phase and um, you are going to write this part and finish so you can also write pigments can be separated from this dyes can be separated from this yes metals can be separated from this So welcome back students to one more session of your metallurgy chapter i think with this topic we'll be completing the whole of metallurgy chapter uh, in this particular uh, topic i'll be teaching about the thermodynamical aspects as well as electrochemical aspects of your metallurgy right so you would have seen this diagram in your uh, textbook the ligam diagram isn't it right so well, let us see what are the frequently asked questions in under this ligam diagram and let us start with the first question what actually or explain in brief ligam diagram now this ligam diagram was first introduced by hjt ligam so the person who has introduced this is hjt ligam right so this is not uh, required for us like this is only for your info so n is silent in this ligam basically ligam diagram explains us two important concepts that is what you have to stress in your answer the first most important thing is it's going to tell us okay let us first put it in bullets this diagram will explain me to or it will help me to take or cho choose the correct reducing agent basically why are we doing or why are we learning this metallurgy we are trying to convert the metal uh, from the ore 
the, we are converting that ore into a metal oxide and after that metal oxide we are trying to use uh, different uh, reducing agents to reduce it to the required the metal which we are uh, supposed to extract so that choice of that reducing agent which reducing agent should you use at what time which will reduce whether the higher ones will reduce the lower ones or not the lower ones will reduce the higher ones or not that is what is important so elegram diagram basically explains us or it gives us to know the choice of reducing agent so the first important keyword is choice of reducing agent right so next important thing it will also tell us whether the reaction is feasible or not will the reaction proceed in the forward direction or will the product formation is not feasible will it stop at a particular point so that feasibility that flexibility is explained by the elegant diagram so it uh, it explains the feasibility of reduction of metal oxide to form product or if you want to make it as simpler than this right it explains the feasibility of a reaction this also you can write or you can write feasibility of a reaction this is also okay fine so basically your elegant diagram we are this diagram is represented in the form of a graph very important what is it going to take it's going to take two important factors first is delta g naught on the y-axis and uh, delta t on the x-axis okay what is this uh, delta g basically right so i have to write that also isn't it so it is definition so this is um, it helps us now definition is it is a graphical representation it is a graphical representation of so what do we take we have taken delta g we'll see what is delta g delta g on y-axis and temperature that is t on x-axis simple done so now we have already studied in grade 11 gibbs free energy have you studied that is why we call thermodynamical factor of this particular uh, metallurgy so in like grade 11 when we studied we studied delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s this is what is you have studied in gibbs free energy yes the amount of free energy which explains the uh, if the gibbs free energy is negative the reaction is compulsory if you get negative answers the reaction is compulsory feasible it will go in the forward direction give you products so here what is delta G delta G is Gibbs free energy delta H is entropy T is your temperature change in entropy change in Gibbs free energy temperature this is not change it is temperature and delta S is change in entropy right this is the fact now what did uh, Gibbs do he has picked up this concept of Gibbs free energy at equilibrium state right so at equilibrium he spoke everything in terms of equilibrium that became a biggest limitation for uh, ligand diagram right so they've asked me to explain in brief so I'm trying to explain put it in brief terms I'm when I go into the detailed explanation I'll clearly give you what what is what so just right he explains he explains Gibbs free energy Gibbs free energy so Gibbs free energy at equilibrium means what what is at equilibrium we are going to represent it as delta g naught delta g naught is Gibbs free energy at equilibrium right so which is equal to rt ln k k is what equilibrium constant yes this is what is your Gibbs free energy at equilibrium and this is your Gibbs free energy when that particular temperature is uh, you have noted so this is the basic thing of elegant diagram I will meet you again with one more important concept how to explain Gibbs free energy so now I've given you an idea of uh, elegant diagram let us go into a little bit detail of elegant diagram so now basically you have a series of metal oxides here just observe metal uh, getting oxidized forming metal oxide everywhere you find metal oxides isn't it so now we are going to choose whether if I have to reduce this metal oxide to metal which reducing agent should I use right so should i use a higher one above than this or for this should i use now for aluminium uh, oxide or okay, aluminium trioxide i have to reduce aluminium trioxide into aluminium metal so i have to choose whether should i use magnesium 
or magnesium metal for that because for reduction of metal oxide I have to use a metal isn't it yes so because this metal ox this magnesium comes out with oxygen is mg1 aluminium is out so I have to choose I have to know the information whether should I pick up magnesium for reduction of aluminium or should I pick up zinc for aluminium it the, that is what is your elegam diagram now elegam diagram I say and also let us write the limitations in this now we'll be doing some fake use also on elegam so that's easy for you to answer now I said basically elegam diagram speaks in terms of or thermodynamic aspects of elegam diagram it speaks in terms of delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S now what is the concept you have to remember three important things here what <coughs> now first condition one if I start increasing the temperature, now temperature is here, when I start increasing the temperature 400, 800, 1200, I am going to increase the temperature. So first condition is when you increase the temperature, what will happen to, to this whole multipl multiplication term? Automatically the entropy also increases, isn't it? So when the temperature increases, T delta S also increases. Then when this is increasing, what will happen to Gibbs free energy? Delta G then becomes negative yes or no so here what is happening when it is increasing delta ds this becomes positive and delta g becomes negative when the negative uh, delta g value is negative that means the reaction is feasible 100 percent the reaction is feasible and you can use that reducing agent for reaction okay till now you didn't understand when i do the examples you'll be able to understand let us see condition two in condition two what am i going to take now this is your concept now i am if I say increase in temperature, T delta S is decreased, increased. Now suppose if I decrease delta S, if the uh, temperature, okay, let us write, temperature, decrease in temperature, so T delta S becomes negative, less. So automatically delta G becomes positive. When delta G becomes positive, the reaction is not feasible. The value, if you get a negative positive value, that because uh, the lower the energy the reaction system, uh, lower the energy of the system, the feasibility of the reaction is more. That is what you've studied in grade 11 thermodynamics. It's the same way. If I get delta G answer as positive, that means the reaction is not feasible. These two things you have to remember. Now, I also said <coughs> we are going to study the uh, limitations. Before going into that, let us remember one, one more thing. The metals which are at the lower end of the graph. Now I am seeing magnesium oxide below, aluminium also trioxide below, right? The metal oxides which are at the lower end cannot be reduced by metals which are above in the series. Which are above in the series, they cannot reduce these metals. We will see why is that. Well, let us write that. Metal oxides at lower end of the graph cannot be reduced I'm just giving you uh, conditions so that it's easy for us to apply in the uh, FAQs cannot be reduced by metals above in the graph above in the graph okay this is what is that now what are the limitations of this the elegant diagram basically it speaks only about two, one, two things one is how to choose a reducing agent and how can or with, uh, whether the reaction is feasible or not but what is happening is it explaining any, anything about the rate of the reaction kinetics of the reaction no isn't it i'm not speaking any terms rate of change of reactant product no so first limitation of elegam is it did not explain anything about the rate of the reaction first most important so we can write that <coughs> rate of the reaction could not be explained okay then what else every time I said Gibbs free energy speaks only at equilibrium the concept of elegam diagram speaks Gibbs free energy at equilibrium every time it is very difficult to particularly come and speak about the equilibrium state isn't it so you, you can't apply it for all the reactions yes so that particular equilibrium state if you if I have to see the different varieties of reactions that attaining equilibrium calculating the equilibrium at that particular point seeing the rate of the reaction uh, seeing the reducing agent of for that particular reaction not feasible not uh, you know clearly explained so it speaks only at at what it speaks means it it is applied it is applied 
only at equilibrium conditions okay let us use all these whatever i told now for different faqs of elegam diagram right so let us see one question which is now i'll be doing all the frequently asked questions in elegam diagram so you'll be finding the same old examples everywhere but uh, i felt these are very relevant for your board exam so i picked up a uh, few examples and let us solve all those questions so what do they give us the choice of reducing agent in a particular case depends on thermodynamic factor okay accepted that is what we say every time whenever we are speaking about a reducing agent i have to speak in terms of gibbs free energy at, uh, at equilibrium right so they have asked me to explain with an example please learn one example uh, perfectly so that you can use whenever such questions asked for you so now i i'm going to take uh, two examples Right, let us let me write. First, I am going to pick take pick up two metals. First, I am going to take chromium. This is again a famous example. So, as I said, elegam diagram, chromium and aluminium is given everywhere. So, I took this. So, chromium, I am going to allow it to form, or <coughs> in the presence of oxygen, this forms chromium trioxide. Right, the delta G value for this is uh, minus five hundred kilojoules per mole. Let us label this equation as A. Let us balance. This is two. Now oxygen is three. So if I multiply by three by two, <coughs> just see two and two gets cancelled. Leftover is fractional balancing. So simple. When I cancel this and this gets cancelled, leftover is three oxygen. So three oxygens. The same thing. Now I'm going to take aluminium. I'm going to supply oxygen to this. This is again getting converted to metal oxide Al two O three. Now delta G value for this is minus nine hundred kilojoules per mole. Now again the same thing. Aluminium is two. I'm balancing with two. Oxygen is three. I have to take three by two. Two and two gets cancelled. Fractional balancing. I'm left over with three three moles of oxygen. Done. So now this. Let me take this as B. Now I have to calculate. I have to know using this example whether the reaction is feasible or not. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to subtract because I have to calculate the delta G value. Subtract A from B. So I'm going to subtract this whole equation from B. What do I get when I subtract? I'm going to get reactants on this side. Just subtract Cr two O three plus two Al. Correct. Gives me <coughs> Al two O three plus two Cr. Simple. That is what we have got. This minus this. When you do, you'll get this equation. So when I subtract this value and this value, how much do I get? I'm going to get delta G value is equal to minus 400 kilojoules per mole. Now see what value did I get? I got a negative Gibbs free energy value. So when I get negative value, automatically I can say the reaction is feasible. Yes, you have to get negative value to tell whether the reaction is feasible. So what you write? Delta G is Negative, hence reaction is feasible. Okay, now when reaction is feasible, you said fine. But what is important here? Which one can I use for reducing agent? Now see, <coughs> I can if I see the answer, if I see the value of this, which is more uh, negative for you, your aluminium. Correct. Seeing this value directly, if I see also, I can say this is more negative. So I can use aluminium to reduce chromium trioxide into chromium. Understand? Same. See here, I've got this. Aluminium can be used to reduce chromium trioxide to chromium. Let us write that first point. So this is your first point. Second point, aluminium can be used because higher the uh, value. Can be used as reducing agent. So for what? For Cr two O three. Now let us learn the other way. Can I use chromium to reduce aluminium trioxide? Chromium to reduce aluminium trioxide? No. See the value? Yes. But chromium cannot be used for reduction of aluminium trioxide. So this is how you are going to write your answer. see one more question we gradually going into the graph now so what is this question between car c carbon that is coke and carbon monoxide which is the better reducing agent at 673 kelvin so as i said we are going to see you calculate uh, your uh, ligand diagram based on delta g not value i think uh, please uh, check never g i uh, maybe i've written g in some this please check i'm sorry for that the delta g not is important right
So delta G naught value is in temperature. Now they said compare between carbon and carbon monoxide. Now in this graph, where is carbon existing? Carbon is here, right? Now carbon monoxide is here. So what do they say? Between this and this, which is a better reducing agent at 673 Kelvin? Now where is the 673 Kelvin? These are all delta G naught values. These are all temperature values. Now 673 Kelvin is here. Now this is your 673 Kelvin. They said at 673 Kelvin, if I go, just see here, the carbon monoxide monoxide graph line and your carbon line both are exactly coincident means you have both the values you can just call see both the points are touching at this 673 this is what is 673 yes now they're asking can i use i should i use carbon or carbon monoxide to form carbon dioxide so to form co to co2 or c to co2 which one should i use now see Higher the Gibbs free energy value means negative the Gibbs free energy value that is a better reducing agent. Now let us see for carbon monoxide the negative value is minus 600. Now for carbon when I see the negative value is minus 350. Yes, see here, this is carbon monoxide. If I take this line of this joining at this particular line, it's minus 600. Higher. Here, this is only at the 350, this line. 50. So, which is higher, more, uh, more uh, this one, negative value? So, I can say carbon monoxide has higher negative value, hence CO can be used as better reducing agent for converting CO to CO2. This is important. Right, that. Let us come back and see. It's almost a similar question, and we'll be doing for every metal like that. So, why is zinc not extracted from zinc oxide through reduction through using this? What do they say? Why is zinc not extracted? Why is zinc not extracted from zinc oxide? Okay, zinc oxide is here. Uh, use through reduction using CO. Why can't I use? CO for the reduction of zinc, I mean extraction of zinc from zinc oxide. Finally, the metal only we are going to get, isn't it? So now observe, <coughs> these are all delta G naught values. It's the same answer like that. When I see your C CO value, this is the, this is lying above this negative value, and this is below that. Yes. So which one can I can I use this? I, what did I say? The metals which are below cannot be reduced by those which are above because of the higher Gibbs free energy values. So again, the metals which are below cannot be reduced by the metals which are above because of higher delta G value. So that is a reason you can write metals below cannot be reduced. One more thing also due to higher <coughs> Gibbs free energy values that's it that is your answer so let us see next set of questions now uh, earlier I did one question like this only which is which is a better reducing agent uh, whether it is carbon or carbon monoxide at one particular temperature I've marked that also that is 673 Kelvin now what happens if there is no temperature mentioned in the question earlier when they've given me the temperature I compared it okay at 673 this line exists here this exists here this exists here then I said okay fine that is what is important because zinc oxide is here carbon is below that and the carbon monoxide is above and when I see I've mentioned but here when they've not given me any temperature how should I say simple now see they asked me to compare between C and CO where is that where is the CO first let us see for zinc oxide so zinc oxide the line is lying here this line now where is that carbon lying right carbon <coughs> when I see okay this is one carbon that is car uh, carbon to carbon monoxide or carbon monoxide is uh, obtained from carbon okay there is one more line of carbon where carbon is converted to carbon dioxide right so there is here this is a carbon now there is one more thing which I have to see carbon monoxide carbon monoxide is here carbon monoxide getting converted to carbon dioxide so my concentration should be more on this line one this line two and this line three important yes now see when I said uh, the Gibbs free energy lower the Gibbs free energy stronger is a reducing agent yes now when I see this line the zinc oxide line the Gibbs free energy change is going above so which line is lying below carbon 
which line is lying above carbon monoxide which one can i choose the one which is above can't uh, reduce it isn't it so carbon monoxide is lying above zinc and carbon is lying below zinc so carbon is a better reducing agent than co for <coughs> zinc oxide reduction why i already said the gibbs free energy values are very much lower compared to zinc so gibbs free energy values are lower compared to zinc yes for which one lower uh, for carbon then co that's it. Let us see this question. They asked me, is the reduction of metal oxide, uh, yeah, reduction of metal oxide easier, okay, if the metal formed is in liquid state or solid state? Now, we very well know our criteria for studying metallurgy is basically to convert the metal oxide to metal. Now, they said, if the metal oxide is in liquid state, uh, is it feasible or the metal oxide in solid state is feasible? Now, tell me which one solid, liquid or gas, which is, uh, which has high uh, kinetic energy yes your liquid state isn't it so when kinetic energy is high what will happen temperature will be high means that means when the temperature is higher the kinetic energy will be higher okay let us speak in terms of delta g so when i have to write the answer i have to see whether it if it is liquid or solid okay delta g is equal to delta h minus t delta s now they said if it is solid if it is liquid is it feasible now i said i'll tell i'll justify the answer as the metal should be in liquid liquid state this is my answer now i'm going to justify this now see when i increase the temperature right the kinetic energy is very high means the liquid kinetic the molecules of the liquid are very high done that means when you are increasing this this whole quantity t delta s becomes more it becomes your uh, uh, higher value it increases or uh, automatically so t delta s value increases when this is increasing delta g becomes less that means negative value so when it is negative value the reaction or the state of the metal should be liquid so this is how you're going to write question so what does this say suggest a condition under which magnesium could reduce alumina the two equations are this now what did I do? I have just picked up concentrated on these two graphs because the remaining should not confuse you all. So what did they say? At <clears throat> which is a better reducing agent they said. They said whether aluminium will reduce magnesium oxide to form magnesium metal or aluminium uh, magnesium will reduce aluminium oxide to form aluminium metal they said well let us see from the ligand diagram now we have seen <coughs> magnesium and aluminium are coinciding at one particular point the formation of both are coinciding at one particular point that is 1623 kelvin right so for the formation of this when i see both are coinciding at this point 1623 done now what happens i very well said <coughs> If I take this point as the common point, now below this 1623, now which is lying below, yes, now I'm coming towards the side, below 1623 Kelvin, if I come towards the side, magnesium is lying at the lower end and aluminium is lying at the higher end. So what should I write? First important thing, below 1623 Kelvin, magnesium reduces Al2O3, done. Now, suppose if I am going above 1623, now see above 1623, what happened to magnesium uh, formation and Gibbs free energy formation, it is going above, see, yes, this is magnesium, above, so above will not reduce will, the one which is at lower, so I should remember that, uh, I have to write above 1623 Kelvin, which will act now, aluminium, this is aluminium line, isn't it, now, aluminium is lying now, above this so 16 above 1623 aluminium reduces mg that's it so we are going to almost come to the end of the chapter now i'm going to finish off the chapter with electrochemical aspects of okay electrochemical principles of metallurgy so thermodynamic aspects we've learned based on the elegam diagram now we're going to do be study based on electrode potential so now uh, basically you would have learned by this time maybe in your schools you have learned the electrochemistry chapter where you have seen in the electrochemical series isn't it now what are we going to how are we going to relate metallurgy with electrode potential values 
the more the key let us see the keywords first but now whenever we are speaking about electrochemical aspects you have to speak in terms again the same gibbs free energy but here i'm going to use the formula minus n f e not okay now what is this delta g is a gibbs free energy standard gibbs free energy yes n is the number of electrons Uh, the transaction of number of electrons from the anode and the cathode next f is the faraday of electricity and e not is electrode potential isn't it <clears throat> you have studied uh, the electrode potential of the redox couple you have already studied i uh, hope you know the concept what i am trying to explain so this is a, for the redox couple one is getting oxidized one is getting reduced one is getting oxidized that is your redox couple now what happens is we are going to study or we are going to study the nature of the reducing agent based on their electrode potential values now we very well know in the electrochemical these are you i picked up certain examples in the electrochemical series when i see when i go from top to bottom the reducing capacity or the reducing agent becomes maximum so the lower category of the electrochemical series are best reducing agents when i go from below to above the higher category agents are the best oxidizing agents that is what you have to remember these are good reducing agents these are the best oxidizing agents or good oxidizing agents now i have a series of elements here now i have to know based on the electrode potential values i have to know which will act as a better reducing agent let us see suppose if i take aluminium now i am going down the group this is like this right okay <clears throat> now when i say aluminium aluminium has a negative value or electrode potential of minus 1.66 now i said as we go down the group the one which is at the below is the best, best reducing agent now if i have to say aluminium can it it reduce chromium or will it reduce magnesium i said which is better reducing agent i mean i go down so for chromium the better reducing agent is this yes or no for nickel the better reducing agent is this for lead the better reducing agent is this yes or no because the, when i see this series this is the best reducing agent now let us come down and see for magnesium if i have to reduce magnesium can i use aluminium wrong isn't it this is more stronger reducing agent than this so on what basis am i saying i'm saying based on electrode potential values once again aluminium can act as reducing agent for converting what what can it convert because this is according to the series the lowest one is maximum it can convert the above ones all you can take converting cr o3 yes nio pbo to the respective metals correct now the same al that particular temperature <coughs> al cannot reduce magnesium oxide to magnesium simple yes now because it is lying uh, below that and this is better reducing agent than this higher than this now suppose if i take one more example i am going to take uh, copper right i am going to take an example of copper now suppose i know the electrode potential of this now i am going to take uh, your uh, iron now very well know compared to this and this which is highly reactive this is highly reactive metal isn't it this is highly reactive so now whichever is highly reactive will going to replace this so what happens copper gets converted to cu solid and this gets converted to fe plus 2 yes and then this is your less reactive or le uh, less reactive okay this is less reactive i can write here also less reactive less reactive because metal i should not write here because the metal is only going to reduce isn't it so i should not write here less reactive this is highly reactive so the highly reactive metal replaces the low reactive metal and this particular one goes to the cathode and settles and where from where it is extracted so this is your basic thermodynamic example when i go to electrochemistry i'll give you a detailed explanation of your uh, uh, electrode potential values a uh, number of electrons faraday's how to calculate nernst equation and everything so i'll meet you again this is this is what is your chapter i have done every corner of your uh, ncrt textbook i hope you've understood the concepts i'll be meeting you again with the board papers and immediately the next chapter follows metallurgy chapter yes